Good afternoon, or good morning, or good day, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the 11th annual nonprofit public policy for symposium, co hosted by Arnova, Independent Sector, and the Nonprofit Policy Forum. The theme of this year's symposium is Nonprofits 9 to 5 What a Way to Make a Living. And we'll focus on the nonprofit workforce and nonprofits as employers. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment by respectfully acknowledging that I'm joining you today from Ohio, the ancestral home of the Kaskaskia peoples, and that two of our host organizations are based in or near Washington, DC, ancestral home of the Nakachtank and the Piscataway peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Kaskaskia, Nakachtank, and Piscataway tribes. Thank you. Please let us know the indigenous lands that you're on right now in the chat. And if you're not sure whose land you're on, you can follow the link that we'll put in the chat to find out. Okay, so let's jump in. I'm Lynette Cook and I'm the executive director of ARNOVA. If you're not familiar with ARNOVA, it stands for the Association for Research on Nonprofit Organizations and Voluntary Action. So you can see why we're more efficiently and affectionately known as ARNOVA. I'm delighted today because this symposium is the result of a great partnership between ARNOVA and Independent Sector and the Nonprofit Policy Forum. Independent, independent Sector obviously is the practitioner expertise. So many of their members are, are doing the work day to day. They're, they're the experts in the field. Together with ARNOVA, our members are the research experts with the methodologies that can help us understand the big picture. And Nonprofit Policy Forum brings the newest research to everyone in a free format. I'm delighted that Nonprofit Policy Forum has joined us as the official third sponsor. Many of their leadership have been involved with this symposium for the last several years, but this is the first year having them as an official sponsor, and I'm delighted. The value add that they bring is phenomenal, both in their expertise, but also in the, the fact that their journal is open access. So there's no paywall, and practitioners can easily access the newest research. Be on the lookout for that from them for a, a, a edition on just this symposium that should be out in early spring. We'll have more on that later. So now I'm delighted to welcome Murray Kim, who is the co-editor in chief of Nonprofit Policy Forum and associate professor of nonprofit studies and MPA program director at George Mason University. Murray. Thank you, Lena, for a nice introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Mira Kim, and I have the unique experience of being deeply involved with the R3 urbanization uh, that are hosting this uh, symposium today. So first of all, I'm, uh, I'm the visiting scholar at the independent sector, and I'm also a co-editor in chief for Nonprofit Policy Forum, the open access, free access uh, uh, um, scholarly journal dedicated to nonprofit policy issues. And I'm also proud to serve on Arno Vars Board of Directors. So I'm deeply involved with our three amazing organizations that are hosting this important symposium today. So um, there's a bit of history of this symposium, and this is the 11th time that we are holding the symposium which represent the true partnership between the practitioner world and academic world. And it's uh, great that we are adding a nonprofit policy forum to bring the, all the uh, uh, amazing discussion coming up from this symposium into the writing. And Manuel is posting the link to, to um, link, link where you can find our reports coming from the last 10 years of symposium. So if you wanna see the history of uh, all the discussion, great discussion that we had between academic world and practitioner world, please visit this link to see the reports coming from the previous symposium discussion. And Nonprofit Policy Forum has been also publishing special issues dedicated to the symposium discussion. And we are planning to publish another issue that are based on the topics that will be discussed today. So I've been part of the planning committee for this symposium 
And it has been my privilege to be part of uh, all the discussion the planning committee have had for the last uh, one year. And over the last uh, several months, uh, we have been discussing what are the most uh, uh, immediate issue that the nonprofit sector is facing. And of course, there's a pandemic, but then we realize as a group that in addition to all the challenges the pandemic brought to the field, that are the persistent uh, systemic challenges that have existed in the field for a long time have bursted out, which is the workforce issue. The nonprofit workforce issue has been discussed uh, sporadically, but it has never gotten its full attention despite the, the persistent issues that have brought to the field. But then with the ch additional challenge the pandemic brought that we are now facing the great workforce issue in the sector. And this has been an issue because despite the, the huge size and importance of the nonprofit sector, the nonprofit workforce has been relatively invisible to policymakers. And because it has been invisible, it has received little or no uh, policy discussion. For instance, the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't release regular workforce data for the nonprofit sector. And no data means like there's no evidence based on which we can have meaningful conversation. Uh, and, and as we can all face now, that the pandemic has just uh, uh, highlighted this issue that has been underlying in the sector. And, and when we, we announced the theme that, that resonated with uh, Dolly Parton's iconic the nine to five, um, and we, when we highlighted the workforce issue that we were surprised to hear that the number of registrants uh, the number of registration for this symposium event has soared of above 500. So as of now, we have more than 510 registrations for the symposium. And this has been the record number so far. And I believe it reflects the importance of the issue that we are all facing and recognizing. That being said, I'd, I'd like to welcome Jeff Moore, Chief Strategy Officer at Independence Sector, to introduce him himself. Thank you, Murray, and thanks, Lynette. And Murray, the first thing I will say is we are going to fix that Bureau of Labor Statistics problem, right? We're going to make sure that our sector gets the workforce data, the employment data that it deserves as the third largest employer of the private workforce in this country. So. Thank you. Um, I have really two jobs here in this conversation. The first is to add a welcome from independent sector to all of you. Um, this symposium and this partnership is one that really excites IS for a variety of reasons. And maybe most important, it is because this is a way in which we can connect the dots in very, very tangible ways between the best of the research community, the best of the practitioner community, and the needs of folks doing the work on the ground to come up with solutions to problems that hold our sector back. And at the end of the day, we know that all of us on this call are here because we're striving to build a healthy and equitable sector, which is a necessary precondition to moving this country forward. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. The second job that I have, which also is very exciting for the IS community in particular, is to introduce our incoming CEO, Dr. Akila Watkins. Akila is not actually with IS yet. Um, she doesn't formally join us until January. So we think it's especially important to note that she's joining us today we believe that is in part because of how she values this relationship between the practitioner community and the research community, and because of the experience that she has as a nonprofit leader in understanding the issues that uh, underlie our workforce and power our workforce. So a few words of introduction for Akila before I turn this over to her. Um, she is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer 
of the Center for Community Progress, America's nonprofit leader for turning vacant spaces into vibrant places. Akil has been a sector leader for more than 25 years, starting, I think I read about the age of 14, <laughs> when you started working to convert a, a vacant lot and an abandoned home uh, into a community center in Roosevelt. I think that's Roosevelt, Long Island, right? So not very yes. far from where yes. I grew up, yes. actually. My dad went to Roosevelt High School. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a link. Um, she is a mission-focused executive who has served in the Obama administration, Neighborhood Works America, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Center for the Study of Policy, Social Policy. And I also know she has deep roots as a community organizer doing the hard and critical work of getting people registered to vote. And there is little that is more important to us than that. So finally, soon we have the opportunity to call her our CEO, and we're really excited for that. But now, Akila, I wanna turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that warm welcome. Um, and thank you all. I'm really excited to be here today and share a few thoughts. First, I would like to thank Lynette and Murray for the critical partnership and for the opportunity to, to join today's symposium. It means a lot to me, and thank you again for that. I would like to welcome the session participants and again note. Um, the record breaking registration numbers that indicate the health of recovery of the nonprofit workforce is a, is a top of mind uh, topic for the entire sector. Um, and then, you know, next, I would just like to uh, share that the nonprofit sector, um, and the workforce of the nonprofit sector has been through a lot in the last few years in particular. We are the backbone of this country. Um, we help in a lot of ways bridge the public and private relationships. Um, and a lot of ways we help people become more civically involved um, in their local communities and how those communities get expressed at both uh, a state and national level. But over the last two years, this nonprofit sector has been through a lot. And that, and that is not going to stop as we move out of COVID and more into the normality of our lives again. And so I'm excited about this forum so we can um, be more strategic and we can um, be more explicit around how we help support um, the workforce that has to fuel so much of the American life we all experience and love. So, um, a, you know, a couple of things. Um, the nonprofit sector, as we all know, is the third largest private employer and our workforce, whether that's paid or voluntary, is critical in our ability to do the work to ensure that all people can thrive in this country. And gathering today, I hope to better understand the root causes driving the dynamics in our workforce and to really uplift research informed by lived experience and data to shape policy and practice. So um, there's so many things that excite me about this conversation. You heard a little bit about it. But one thing I will say is that the workforce of the nonprofit sector is the backbone. And so um, how we um, help to uh, strengthen this sector is by helping to strengthen the people that make this sector strong every day. So thank you again for the opportunity to attend. And Jeff, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Akila. I think Lynette, we're ready to get going with our first panel. Um, so I'll turn this back over to you. And again, thanks to each of you for your partnership. Thank you. And thank you, Akila. Well said. And we're looking forward to getting to work with you as we as much as we love working with Jeff and the rest of your team. Okay, so before we dive in, of course, there are a few logistical notes to go over. First, today's webinar is being recorded and closed captioning is, en is enabled. Our program is broken into two sections. The first will examine some of the factors and trends that contribute to the current workforce challenges. The second section will focus on how the sector can attract and retain workers and create a more inclusive and equitable experience for all nonprofit employees. 
Each section will begin with a brief overview of the featured research and a discussion with a nonprofit practitioner about what the findings mean for the sector. After that is when you all come in. We're gonna open the discussion up and give you a chance to ask questions and share your reactions to what you've heard and your insights. And we might also ask you a question or two. At any point during the symposium, feel free to share your thoughts and reactions in the chat and or submit a question using the Q&A feature. You are all essential to the success of this event. Your contributions will help us make sense of the research that we'll hear today and importantly, figure out what we need to do with that information. So please do not be shy. And I've worked in the nonprofit sector my entire career. I know you're not shy, so be, be contributing. Thank you. Okay, now that we've grounded our approach, I'd like to hand things over to Mireille Kim to get us started with our first section, It's All Taken and No Given. And I did think about singing the Dolly Parton song, but you wouldn't like that. You're going to love the section, though, A Strained Nonprofit Workforce. Mireille? Thank you, Linda, for a nice introduction. So uh, we have some fantastic research to highlight that have some important implication. And I'm very excited to introduce our amazing presenters. And I want to repeat what Luna has already emphasized. Please don't be shy to share your questions, reactions, while you hear this research highlight or during the Q&A session. Uh, the true goal of this uh, symposium is to have the conversation, so please don't be, don't be shy. Uh, we have Dr. Lobi, uh, Lobi Shaw, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Service and Administration at the Bushy School of Government and Administration at Texas A&M University. Her research examines issues of nonprofit management, accountability, capacity, and evaluation, and meaningfulness in public service work. We also have Dr. Sherry Hyde, who is an associate professor in the School of Social Work at Temple University. Her areas of scholarship include community capacity building and civic engagement, multicultural education, feminist practice, organizational transformation, social movement, socioeconomic stratification, and working conditions in human service agencies. And we also have Dr. Carrie. Or Berger, who is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Her research examines the dynamics of work and working in mission-driven organization, the creation, translation, and maintenance of nonprofit organization, and employees as they, they navigate careers in and out and around mission-driven works. So we will begin with Dr. Lobsha. So please. Greetings, everyone. While I share my screen, I just want to say I appreciate all of you and your willingness to come and hear us talk about our research. My colleagues are also on the call and they'll jump in later on, but we're here today to talk about our paper on Beyond Psychic Income. And this really came out of this question we've been working on for a few years to try to understand how does meaningfulness in public service and nonprofit work really intersect with some of the darker sides, which is work life imbalance and burnout and precarity in nonprofit work. So our study was an exploratory study where we did interviews with 45 nonprofit and public managers across the US. And really what we wanted to understand was not only what makes your job meaningful, but how does it ha what, what do you do when the workplace is changing and becoming more marketized? And so we see that workers are really experiencing this hybrid, hybridized workplace where both things like efficiency and productivity and performance measurement are being given equal consideration as you as an individual and your pro-social motivations and desire for social impact. And all these things, how they intersect to become what makes work meaningful. So, as you expect, people in the nonprofit sector do report that there are wonderful things about their jobs that they love. They love the people, they love the impact they get to have, um, and they love the ultimate mission of many of these nonprofits. However, there is a challenge here, and that is because they love their work and they have overcommitted. Sometimes there's a dark side to the meaningful work, and psychic income is just one example. And that's just is the idea that I'm willing to um, do more and potentially be exploited or underpaid and get a psychic benefit from my work, even though I don't get paid. And, and there's kind of a growing expectation or has been an expectation that that's enough. 
work should matter, it's meaningful, and therefore maybe you don't get paid. But what we are seeing and what we kind of talk about in the paper is these increasing trends where people are saying, no, I, I want to be paid for my work and I want to be able to be creative and I want to be able to advance my career objectives and have flexibility in the work. And so what does this mean for organizational leadership? So for nonprofit leaders, right, the question is, how do I keep my people? Um, and knowing that trends are suggesting that people and globally are engaging in a new worth it calculation. Is my job worth it? When I combine my pay and work-life balance and things that are meaningful to me, I can find meaning in other places. And so maybe this job isn't worth it. And so leadership in our research really has an important role into making people feel valued and to helping them connect their meaningfulness in their work to organizational outcomes. Um, but this is particularly exasperated by COVID and the changing pandemic and how people's experience of work is evolving. And one of the things we did find in our research is that women and people of color in particular really identify with their job and their identity can be wrapped up in their work and they face what we call a triple bind. And that is they love their work, they try to navigate the mission of social impact, but they also feel the, the pool of productivity and performance measurement and doing it all and being wonderful. And then on top of that, there's a layer of gender and racialized organization that really affects their ability to enjoy their work. And, and this ultimately affects how well we can keep our workers. So just some overview, these are just the highlights of some of our findings. I, I have to say, right, there is no one magic bullet for helping the workforce out there. Not meaningful work can be very complicated in the nonprofit sector. And you do have a neoliberalizing changing workforce that is exasperated by COVID. So here we just wanna make a couple of strategies and recommendations around these topics. Um, I think it goes without saying, people wanna be paid. They want pay equity, they want fairness. Um, one of our interviewees said at some point, they need to show me the money. Like all these things are there, my job is meaningful, but at some point I need a financial reward. And so there is federal action that can be done. And we there's been acts multiple years to try to create a, a raising minimum wage standard. And in particular, we've seen particular cities and states across the country take a stand on paying their workforce. And it has not completely made the nonprofit sector fall apart because they pay their employees an heck of a wage. So there is strategies out there to help think about this. Secondarily, we want to talk a little bit about flexibility and balance. People, um, right, COVID changed the way people view their work. And while they want balance and they want to be able to meet the demands of their life and other things and people in their lives, they also want to be able to do their job and they want to do it well. And this means that the nonprofit sector has to really have strategies and HR plans and the technology that it would take to really understand, implement, and manage a workforce that is remote or hybrid at times. Also people, when they come into work, they wanna know they need to be in work. Um, and our third point is really about relationships. It's old school to say this, but people matter. People cultures are shaping the way people feel valued. And there is a disconnect between what people, um, employers think their employees want and what employees actually do want. And that is employees wanna feel valued. They wanna feel a sense of belonging and leadership matters in this. And then finally, as we wrap up overhead and capacity, it is time that policymakers and funders and capacity builders just recognize that overhead is a dirty word and it has stunted a lot of nonprofit growth and the ability for people to be paid a, a living wage. Um, and so I'll just end with this. Um, we can no longer kind of expect nonprofit workers to stay in nonprofit work because of psychic income. And even though their work is meaningful, today's nonprofit professionals really want and deserve more from their jobs to make it worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, next, we have Dr. Sherry Hyde. Hey, Cheryl, I think you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm talking away without uh, being off mute. Anyway, it's great to be here. And um, I'm going to focus on what I call precarious professionals. These are uh, graduate trained direct service workers in, humans, in the human service sector and the impact that neoliberalism has had on both the sector agencies and the workforce. 
So as folks probably know, the human service sector provides what are called cradle to grave services in public, nonprofit, and uh, for-profit sectors. I will be focusing only on the nonprofit sector today. While a lot of us are focusing on the impact of COVID, I want to take us back 40 years to the start of neoliberal policies and regulations that have, over the last four decades, really promoted private market solutions, austerity measures, a devolution or race to the bottom. This has caused the human service sector to deal with issues of race resource scarcity and delegitimation. In addition to just the sector reeling from neoliberalism, the clients and communities that seek assistance from sector agencies have also been impacted by neoliberalism. So for working class, low income and in poverty populations, we've seen extreme heightened economic precarity and heightened and much more complex health and mental health needs. The combination of neoliberal policies and regulations on the human service sector, combined with the impact neoliberalism has had on clients and communities, has placed an extraordinary strain on overburdened and under-resourced nonprofit human service agencies. And that has been made much worse by the pandemic. I've been interviewing uh, direct service workers over the last several years, uh, both those who are on permanent employment, as well as an increasing number who are working on contingency. And I wanna highlight some themes uh, that have come across in those interviews. First is economic instability. And they talk a lot about the low compensation combined with an increased cost of living and a significant loan debt, especially for recent graduates. Second is just an overburdened workload. They have very heavy caseloads. They are seeing um, probably twice the number of clients they should be seeing. And with that comes mountains and mountains of paperwork that are often done after work hours. And then finally is at agency fragmentation. They feel disconnected from their colleagues and disconnected from their clients. What was interesting is three sort of contradictions also emerged across these interviews. The first is what I call atomized work. And that is that the workflow resembles more a factory assembly line rather than a relationally centered uh, work site. Here, uh, one of the workers shares, I thought social work was social, but it isn't. It's just work and I'm really starting to hate it. Another second is weaponizing passion. And this is really using a commitment that these workers bring to their jobs as a means of extracting additional unpaid labor, uh, psychic income, if you will. Um, although it's psychic expense for the workers. Uh, here, a woman by the name of Brittany says, I love my clients and I believe in the work I do. I've gotten so exhausted by them, meaning management, asking for me to labor for them for free. And finally, is what I call pay to play. The costs of tuition, of having to engage in unpaid internships during your graduate training, licensure costs, supervision costs, because agencies aren't providing supervision on site anymore, leads to a financial burden just to stay in practice. Or as one worker says, I continue to go into debt to help people I care about. So what can, what can be done? Well, I have to say, um, and I'm in social work, that the professional associations have actually done very little. And I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, workers, however, especially younger workers, are taking action. Uh, within the last year, there has been a social work equity campaign that has been launched, and I can provide information on that. There's also increased unionization activity in human service agencies, as well as just sort of across the board. Uh, abolitionist initiatives have begun to spring up in both public health and in social work to really address the racism 
um, and uh, sexism that's sort of baked into some of our uh, institutions. And finally, there is a quiet quitting trend of both workers working to contract and not doing any more extra labor or just resigning. And the resignation rates in the human services is quite high. So I leave us with this. I believe the nonprofit human service sector is at a crossroads with its workforce. We can either continue to acquiesce and even further neoliberalism. We can just stay and assume, but this is just the way it is or we can advocate to dismantle neoliberalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Finally, we have Dr. Carrie Orberger. Hello, thank you very much um, for joining us today. And I apologize in advance um, that I'm getting over a cold and so my voice is a little bit scratchy. Um, the study that I'm going to be sharing with you today is the result of two years that I spent studying frontline workers in the workforce development field, um, looking at their effectiveness with their clients and their job satisfaction. <clears throat> and for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, workforce development nonprofits work with people who have low levels of formal education, as well as those who are formally incarcerated, um, to help them attain and retain employment. And in a nutshell, I think what I found most fascinating about this research was that most frontline workers come out of advanced formal schooling programs. So bachelor's degrees often in social work um, and that this training really prepares them to believe that they can make significant changes in other people's lives. Um, in contrast, I actually found that the most effective employees across the 10 nonprofits that I studied um, had GEDs um, or high school diplomas and a very limited sense of their own agency. And so I'm going to explain a little bit why and then also point to some implications that I think that this has in terms of how we can reform workplace practices and training programs. So in essence, what I found was that frontline workers were evaluating two core dimensions um, of what they found that their occupation expected them to do. Um, their personal agency, so how much agency they felt they had to achieve their occupational expectations and to ameliorate the challenges that were facing their clients. Um, and then how much agency they felt their clients had to ameliorate their own challenges. And that these ranged from being constrained to being emboldened along two different dimensions, along both dimensions, um, and resulted in three unique um, roles that I will explain today. So the first role is a group that I called the fixers. And these individuals had an emboldened sense of their own agency. These were the ones that came out of formal training programs, um, but a constrained sense of their client's agency, right? They really felt like their client's challenges were structurally determined. And these people really closely aligned with the traditional professional model. Um, what I found from these folks is that they went above and beyond. They worked extraordinarily long hours. They felt a lot of sympathy towards their clients. Um, but because they worked such long hours, they ended up burning out quite quickly when they realized that despite how many hours they worked, they still were not able to change their clients' objective situations in the sort of drastic ways that they had hoped to be able to. And what I found was that fixers often would burn out. And when they burnt out, um, they would either leave the occupation entirely or they would transition into a second role. In this role, I called the processors. And what was interesting here was that they moved from feeling like they had an emboldened sense of their own agency and a constrained sense of their client's agency to the other quadrant where they acknowledged that they had constrained agency, but they still had to feel like there was agency somewhere in the system. And so then they felt like their clients had emboldened agency and they started blaming their clients for the facts that they couldn't change their personal situation. Um, and what they often then reverted to was just processing their clients through the system, trying to meet sort of base organizational targets, often that were set by federal funding agencies. These people were fairly apathetic. They took an apathetic approach to their work, an apathetic approach um, to their jobs, and they worked sort of very constrained hours, didn't burn out, but had a very apathetic approach to their work in general. In contrast, the group that I found the most fascinating um, were individuals who had a constrained sense of both their own agency and their client's agency. And these people, I call the company of tours, I'm borrowing that term from the field of liberation theology, um, where the term 
encapsulates sort of the idea of walking along a life journey with somewhere else, with someone else, excuse me, <clears throat> and privileging solidarity and compassion over technical expertise, right? And these people really deviated the most from the traditional model. And what I found is that these people often did not come through formal training programs. They often had a more limited formal education themselves. They often had life experiences or had family members with life experiences that aligned with those of the clients. So rather than having sympathy towards their clients, they really had a deep sense of empathy and understanding. They approached their clients with compassion and they really felt like their goal was to try to affirm their clients' humanity and help them believe in themselves and enjoy their day-to-day -day more. They had much more sustainable um, work-life boundaries and they were most energized and inspired by their clients and by their work. So they really were the most sustainable and successful employees overall. And so I'm just gonna highlight um, four brief implications that I think that this has on how we can think about workforce practices in the nonprofit sector particularly in nonprofits that hire and work, hire frontline workers to work directly with clients. Um, the first is that we really need to think about reforming hiring practices. I think with this huge wave of professionalization and managerialism and marketization that's happened in the nonprofit sector, we've moved to hiring people with more and more advanced degrees. And what I found was actually that moving away from people with advanced formal schooling and hiring people who have life experiences that foster compassion and empathy over sympathy um, was far more effective, both in terms of having a sustainable, um, excited, long-term workforce and in terms of their effectiveness with their clients um, and people who have a really realistic understanding of their own and their client's agency, right, to change different objective situations. And the second um, implication, I think, is, is the desire to set more realistic organizational goals, right? So not setting goals of just processing clients through the system, but then also not setting organizational goals that everybody who goes through a workforce development nonprofit is going to be able to hold a full-time sustainable job because there are so many conditions in society as a whole that's making that challenging for people that organizations need to be able to set their own goals that align at that sweet spot between employee capacity and what clients are needing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, underscoring both of those first two points, I think this is a thread across myself and my colleagues, is really having funder support, both private foundations and government support for grantee-driven hiring decisions and goal setting. So letting that really occur at the organizational locus, um, which is most connected to understanding what clients need and where employees are at. And then finally, and this is a bit outside the scope of the nonprofits themselves, but I really think that we need to revise training programs um, to more accurately prepare frontline workers for their limited agency um, to change objective client situations. And I think this is a difficult situation likely to market, um, but I do think that we need a more realistic and nuanced approach in order to more effectively um, um, prepare employees for the long term in the sector. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Carrie. So all uh, of you have given us a lot to think about and process. Uh, before we dive into the uh, Q&A session, to help us dig into what we just heard, uh, what does this mean? And, and connect what we heard to experience as a practitioner, uh, we brought Ross Tister, who is the founder and president CEO of Fund the People. So Fund the People, um, is an organization that works toward the vision of a social sector fueled by equity, effectiveness, and endurance. And its mission is to maximize investment in the nonprofit workforce. In his many roles, Rusty provides cutting edge new frameworks, ideas, tools, education, and consulting to funders, nonprofit organizations, and intermediaries. He also hosts the Fund the People podcast. So now I'd like to welcome Rusty and hear his perspective and conversation with the presenters. Rusty, please. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for, for that very nice uh, introduction. Hi, everyone. It's kind of funny to be on a Zoom. This could be five people or 500 people, and I'm still sitting here by myself. But uh, Glad to be with you all. 
Um, and thank you to the scholars who shared this important work. Um, as someone who's been um, studying and advocating for investment in the nonprofit workforce um, for a number of years, um, I was just thrilled to um, read these papers and see that there are scholars out there who uh, care about these issues. And I hope it keeps going. Um, so I'm really excited um, just to connect with all of you and to read your important studies. I wanted to share a little bit about some things I've been thinking and writing about and try to connect them to just some of the content that's been shared today. There's a lot of important themes and nuances if you all read the papers, which um, are great. And I hope everyone on this call um, gets them from the registration website and reads them. They're really worthwhile. So I'm gonna try to share my screeny here. Let's see if this will work. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I do want to say just, you know, just to start that um, it's kind of weird to be held up as a practitioner respondent um, uh, to all these scholars. And I don't feel I represent um, the field in any way um, uh, as, as kind of a representative of practitioners. So. I'm glad to be joined by Linda in the next panel as a practitioner respondent. And uh, just want to acknowledge that I'm bringing a limited uh, worldview and uh, lived experience as a middle-aged white Jewish male. Um, so, uh, but I have been studying and advocating on this issue and Fund the People started in 2014 um, as a kind of think tank and influence initiative, um, uh, as was said earlier, to maximize investment in the nonprofit workforce. And one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, we're all thinking and talking about the pandemic as, you know, having uh, really created this crazy experience of burnout and the great resignation and all of these things and layoffs and furloughs. And it's been a really stressful time, right? Um, for, for so many of us in the nonprofit workforce. Um, but, you know, as I was thinking about it, I thought it's really not it, it, on its own what's causing this crisis. It's really been layers of crisis and trauma, honestly, that have been kind of compounding uh, on us in recent years. So uh, I wrote in this recent blog post that there are these five layers of crisis um, and starting kind of in reverse chronological order. So most recently, as I mentioned, the great resignation and include in that all the pandemic workplace conditions that, you know, we're still uh, isolated from each other. We're still overwhelmed by working at home or, um, or feeling lonely working at home, either way, uh, things like that. People are going back to offices, but feeling like they are ghost towns. And so there's all kinds of dynamics. How do our nonprofits kind of reconvening programs, all of those things, serving their member, their, their constituents. Underneath that, you know, there's the racialized and racial politics of our sector that, you know, since the racial reckoning and the murder of George Floyd and all the things that have happened in the last several years, I think it's, it's gotten harder and harder for people of color in nonprofits, for white people in nonprofits uh, to figure out the right things to do, what their roles are, um, and how to you know, live our values in terms of, of being multiracial uh, organizations, being anti-racist organizations, and all of those things. And so it's not to say that racial politics are a crisis in and of themselves, but uh, I think that there have been um, you know, a kind of a crisis experience of how do we respond adequately or more than adequately to what's going on? Under that is just, you know, not to be partisan or anything or too overly political, but the Trump era, I think, was a crisis for the nonprofit workforce in terms of so many policies and constituencies that nonprofits care about 
and work on, uh, and you could rattle off the list. Um, obviously, there are nonprofit folks who were, you know, very supportive of the policies of the Trump administration. So I don't mean to ignore that. But for many, many, uh, in particular, uh, the social justice groups that I care about and the human services groups we're talking about earlier in the research, you know, this this was a crisis period and 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 kind of has a long tail. It's still a crisis from from that period. Before that, we have the Great Recession, which you know we're still kind of feeling some ramifications from the instability of the economy. Um, and although maybe the Great Recession wasn't as bad for nonprofits as it could have been, it was certainly bad for a lot of the uh, clients and constituents we serve, and has had long uh, uh, ripple effects in communities. So those are sort of four re more recent crises we've been through. And then underlying those is this chronic crisis, this chronic condition that preexisted those of a deficit of investment in the nonprofit workforce. Um, you know, about 2015, uh, 2005, 2006, there was this paper from Bridgespan that said there's a deficit of nonprofit leaders. I think that was an incorrectly um, uh, uh, incorrectly titled and incorrect narrative that grew out of that paper that a lot of people have still been using, that there's this deficit of leadership or leaders in nonprofits. I think it's a deficit of investment in the nonprofit workforce that's been the real problem. And it has been chronic. We found looking at um, foundation center data that for the 20 year period from 92 to 2011, about 1% or less of foundation grant dollars went to investments in staff development or leadership development of some kind in grantee organizations. So you can see the red line there is the actual dollars going uh, out of organized philanthropy, growing and growing over that period. And the green line, which you can barely see there at the bottom, uh, is the dollars for what we call or refer to as talent costs or talent investments. And we think it goes further further back than just 92, certainly. Uh, it really is something that's been embedded in um, the way we do fundraising, the way we do grant making, the way people give to nonprofits. Uh, and the deficit is enabled by old myths, like the overhead myth. Um, it's, it's enabled by mindsets that carry with them classist, racist, and sexist assumptions about who works in nonprofits, what they need, and what they deserve. So how does neoliberalism relate to this investment deficit? That's something I've been thinking about since I read everybody's paper. And so this is, this is what came to my mind, is that for about 20 years, we've had this idea of venture philanthropy or new philanthropy. Um, that kind of came out of the technology wealth of the dot-com uh, boom that began in the, in the late 90s. And this, it, it's carried with it ideas like nonprofits should act more like businesses. Philanthropy should be more like a business. We should all focus more on measurable outcomes. Um, and so although this kind of disruption of philanthropy has had good, good elements to it. It's also done some harm. Um, while you know traditional foundations and philanthropy maybe needed to be shaken up, uh, we did not need um, you know this this outcomes measurement mania that uh, would actually reinforce the overhead myth by fetishizing programs as products and workers. Uh, as alienated from their work. Um, basically, you know, just kind of ignoring the nonprofit workers who take the money and turn it into social capital or programs, right? It's not a robot, it's not a machine, it's not a conveyor belt that takes foundation dollars and turns it into social good. There are human beings in that process throughout and it's not a product not a product. So I think this idea of marketization that you all have been talking about in your papers uh, has had this negative effect through 
the idea of venture philanthropy. And I think that has only reinforced the deficit of investment in the nonprofit workforce. Um, so I've been thinking about how do we address the overhead myth? How do we tackle it? How do we bust it and end it for once and for all? And uh, I recently wrote this blog post called Flip the Funding Formula. The idea is that the old way of doing things, using the overhead myth as guidance, is that about 80 to 90 percent of a grant is for program costs. And about probably zero to maybe 20 percent, 30 percent on the very high end is for what gets called overhead which includes all the important things about investing in support and development of staff. The future, I believe, is if we can flip this formula so that program support gets about 10 or 20% of grant dollars, but 80 to 90% of grant dollars are going to improved operations, investments in staff and leadership development and support systems so that nonprofits can actually compensate appropriately. They can uh, provide benefits like health insurance, and they can provide things like uh, retirement savings and, 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 and the training and professional development that people want. Now, this may seem crazy and way out of reality, uh, but we have, to, we have to start changing narratives and we have to offer healthier alternatives and if you, my, my, my image on the right there of the future looks more like real nonprofit budgets. The bulk of our budgets are for our staff line items. It costs very little to buy the muffins uh, and the Zoom accounts we need for programming. So the future, the what I call here, the bedrock reality where people are the bedrock under our programs, um, you know, that, that looks more like reality uh, of our sector. And that, that's what people, nonprofits want and need based on the research that I've been reading. So I wanted to just kind of wrap my little portion here um, with some simple action steps you can take because this can be kind of heady and overwhelming. So I just wanted to make sure I got this plug in that folks should be applying for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness, PSLF, by October 31st. And if you don't need your loans forgiven for doing a decade more, decade or more public service work. Um, your colleagues certainly do. So if you're in HR, if you're an ED, if you're on a board, if you're in an association, make sure your staff or members know and your colleagues know. And you can simply visit pslf.us, which is a bunch of nonprofit folks who've gotten together to make sure that other nonprofit folks are applying to get their loan forgiven. So um, you can do that. Another thought uh, here is, you can endorse, your nonprofit can endorse the Nonprofit Strength and Partnership Act that has been introduced into the House of Representatives. Uh, Fund the People has been a part of a coalition co-convened by Independent Sector and Kaboom um, that has been leading on trying to move this policy. Jeff knows a lot more of it uh, about it than I do, but if you go to the independentsector.org website, click on policy and find the seat at the table campaign, uh, there's a sign on letter where you can endorse um, this act. Finally, I wanted to include, um, we at Fund the People are piloting an online course that teaches the fundamentals of talent investing for nonprofits or funders. So if you're interested in helping to pilot the online course, you can visit our website, click on about, and um, you can submit your name to be part of the pilot. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share, and I'll turn it back over to Mira. Thank you so much, Rusty, and also thank you, Robbie, Sherry, Carrie, Car for all sharing your uh, research insights and your um, field-based insights. So I'd like to bring the audience into the discussion now, and I can see that already there have been heated discussion going on, and, and I know that this uh, issue is overwhelming, but at the same time, if we don't address this workforce issue now, it matters for the uh, for the it's a, it's an existential matter for the sector. So let's dive into the discussion. And as a reminder, 
Please share your thoughts and reactions in the chat or feel free to submit a question in the Q&A box. If you'd like to ask a question or share your reflection on camera, please raise your virtual hand and one of our wonderful support staff will let me know who's got their hand up and I, I will call you and they will promote you to speakers. You can, um, you can ask questions directly to one of our uh, presenters. Um, on this note, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, and I know that our wonderful presenters have already answered some of the questions, but perhaps we can uh, start with a, a one, one question that's on the chat. So Tony Bowen asked, the Sherry mentioned professional association have the leader to support human service workers, and I know, Sherry, that you wanted to... Uh, uh, to expand this idea to share more about this. So can you expound on that and highlight any bright spots? Right, uh, yes. So thanks for asking the question. Um, so it, because I sort of am situated in social work, I'm most familiar with what the major like National Association for Social Workers and the Council for Social Work Education are, and the licensing boards are doing. And I think one of the problems is, is that there's too much of a focus on sort of individual worker responsibility and demands and not any attention to the context. So one example, uh, the, the National Association uh, revised uh, the Code of Ethics recently to include an, uh, uh, basically a mandate that all individual social workers are responsible for engaging in self-help as an ethical obligation. I don't have any problems with uh, self-help and self-care. I think all that's important. Nowhere does it say agencies are responsible for creating supportive work environments that don't burn out their workers. So by the constant focus only on workers and not on the larger systematic context, um, the we fall really short of the of the mark. Um, this isn't about individual training and competencies. This is really about a system that is just collapsing under the weight of all the policy and regulations. And as a as a social work profession, we have not come out, you know, and said this needs to end. What we do is we come out and we say, here are some strategies to adjust. And I, we just can't do that anymore. Thanks, Chair. Uh, somewhat related question, but um, that is that what role will organized labor play in the future of our workforce? So this question comes from Connor Orff on the chat. And you also mentioned some, um, uh, something about the need for the unionized workforce. So if you wanna, expand the idea a little bit more for us. That would be great. Right, so uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a former union organizer, so I'm gonna go all in on this. Um, in fact, I attended, when I was doing clerical organizing, we did a premiere of the nine to five way back when the nine to five movie first came out. And there's nothing like watching that movie with a group of unhappy clerical workers to really uh, get you going. But um, I think what we're seeing um, across not just the human service or nonprofit sector is I think we are seeing especially younger workers entering the workforce saying this just isn't workable. I don't have time for family. I don't have time um, for, uh, you know, anything. Um, and I'm not being paid for what I'm worth. And so I think they're bringing a very different calculus to uh to the employ to, to the labor market and they see unions especially some of the more progressive unions like AFSCME in the public sector or SCIU and 1199 they see them as friendly to their needs they are much more collective in orientation um and so we have seen a number of uh unionized efforts um in the human services, as well as across the nonprofits. Right now, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is a huge nonprofit, we're in the third week of a strike uh, to get management to the table. Um, so I, I do think that this is gonna be a way short of unionization. There's also 
some collective organizing that is going on. Chicago has a human service um, uh, organization, uh, a, a human service collective of human service workers uh, that um, I, I provide a link in my paper. So if you go to the, my uh, paper, you'll see links to that as well as a social work equity campaign with a collection of students and practitioners and faculty trying to get more equitable working conditions. So I think that I think there are these collective responses after about 30, 40 years of individual attempts to negotiate stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, Rusty, uh, you have a hands up, Rusty. Yeah, I just wanted to add, and I'm I'm pro union as well. That I I think one of the challenges um, is that you know we don't have owners in the nonprofit sector. Our organizations don't have owners, and management isn't always management. Sometimes the government and the foundations that fund the nonprofit they're the ones defining, determining the strings on the budget. And so if you're going to raise, try to raise wages, management may not even have the ability to do that. So we still, I think maybe we need a dual strategy of, you know, unionization if people want to go that route, but also we still need to change uh, the way that foundations, donors, and government are funding and investing in nonprofits so that they have the, the budget and the, and the ability to invest in their staff. Uh, yes, um, and I would say that uh, colleagues at the at University of Pittsburgh did a study on um, uh, human services and uh, livable wages, and they it, they asked uh, human service managers who were in favor of it, but they just didn't have the money to do so. I think what we're seeing now, though, our workers are saying you can't balance it on our backs anymore. You've got to do you've got to do something different, and so. Ad, you know, this sort of advocacy really pushing back on foundations and other funding sources to, you know, to do what needs to be done, uh, you know, so these, otherwise we're going to have a massive brain drain, I, I think, out of these uh, already vulnerable uh, sectors. Thank you, Bus. And actually, there was some um, related conversation, a question, um, that was raised in the Q&A box. And so the question was about what can organization build into their budget to reduce the cost for workers, especially the pay to play cost workers. And Rusty provides some answers. And I thought that this can be a nice conversation among the panelists if you wanna chime in. So how can those expenses, the pay to play expenses be extended into negotiation with the private or government funders when discussing the real cost of programs and overhead. Um, and I think I'd like to uh, ask, uh, welcome any of the presenters, including Rusty, to respond to this question. Uh, Rusty, since you provide some answers on the chat, would you like to start responding? <laughs> Sure, uh, sure. I just didn't want to talk again since I just spoke. But um, yeah, I think that um, the real costs and full cost efforts that have happened at uh, Chicago among funders and nonprofits and in at Philanthropy California, the three associations of funders in California have been really important um, to get funders to better understand the real costs it takes for nonprofits to run their programs and services and how grants and things like overhead rates um, do or do not support the real cost. Uh, I just think that they have not within that framework and the research they've done, they've not emphasized the fact that as Tony Bowen mentioned in the comments somewhere, I think in the, in the chat that, you know, about 70% of nonprofit budgets are made up of staff costs. So if you want to address the real costs, you've got to address um, salary and benefits. And um, they may be 70% of the budget, but are they enough given that? Or, or you know, and so, so yeah, I think frameworks like, like real costs um, are important. Things like trust-based philanthropy 
and, and the idea there. Um, the, the push for general operating, multi-year general operating dollars, um, all of those trends and ideas in the field are so important. They each got to address this issue of how do we invest in the workforce as we implement or develop these different ideas in the sector. I actually would add, and I'd refer to Carrie's um, research, uh, one of the huge expenses is in the area of credentialing and postgraduate licensure. Necessary perhaps for some jobs, but I've seen positions where it, it, the agency just either is mandated or feels that it has to have licensure attached to um, attached to positions. And I, I would refer to what Carrie was talking about is that I think we need to take more seriously folks who have a very different kind of experience that they can they bring to the table. Um, you know, and I, I find her work really compelling around that. Uh, so I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Carrie, but I think I think the role of sort of the non-professional credential worker is really important. <clears throat> I, I agree completely, Cheryl, and I do think that we've entered into this sort of race to the top in terms of credentialing, and that's, I think, occurring across all fields within the nonprofit sector and more broadly in society. Um, and I do think that clearly having an advanced degree in particular specialized training is clearly necessary for a lot of positions, but having spent two years doing ethnographic work across these 10 different organizations, for a lot of the positions, it really was not necessary. and. And in many instances, actually, I found it was counterproductive and unhelpful. And so I do think really taking much more seriously what is actually, first of all, figuring out what is the organizational vision, making sure that we have funders that align with that vision, that can support that vision so that that vision is being organizationally driven, right? In the workforce development field, I think like we see in a lot of social service nonprofits that are acting as contracting arms of the government, um, nonprofits, are not given a lot of leeway in terms of what how they want to design and develop and implement their programs because they're following government mandates and having to report particular um, statistics and criteria back to the government, right? So I saw in particular, actually, that sort of the processing role was adopted much more easily in agencies and organizations that had a lot of government funding because that was the sort of broader organizational culture at those organizations, right? Whereas as particularly like um, ethnically focused smaller nonprofits that were really doing a much more holistic array of services with their clients who often had much more flexible private funding were much more likely to be able to support a culture that really supported the accompanyateur model of interacting with clients because it was sort of synergistic with the other ways in which they were interacting with people. And I think in those nonprofits, we did see people, we did see leadership hiring people um, with GEDs or high school diplomas who had an amazing skill set and had 10 to 15 year careers working extremely successfully with the clients that they're working with. So I fully support that. I think that um, while there clearly are many positions that do require advanced degrees and specialized training, at least in the anti-poverty workforce development field, I think that um, that was not true. And so I would love to see more support by leadership and also by the funders that support um, nonprofits in moving in that direction. And Carrie, like some of us on the uh, speaker or in the organizing committee or in the attending, uh, uh, attendees are um, in higher education, providing nonprofit management education and your research has a lot of implication for many of us. And I can't have noticed an uh, amazing remark on the chat that Naketa made. As a nonprofit founder, for the first time in a long time, I feel seen. And I'm sure that this, uh, um, this uh, sentence represents the sentiments that, are, uh, that are, are shared by many attendees. And we were really overwhelmed by the number of uh, uh, the breaking record registration for this particular symposium. So um, we are like, I, I feel like this is really an important issue. Uh, since we've been talking about the real cost and support from funders and government, I wanna pose another question coming from Louis Fong. 
uh, what role does support government support for mental health for frontline staff for nonprofit staff generally play? Uh, in my experience in the nonprofit sector, some of the most motivated uh, who are fixers or accompaniators. Um, so the most motivated staff and volunteers are hardest to hit psychologically when the client's goals they are serving do not succeed. So what kind of support can we seek or how can we justify or how can we persuade the funders, government, to provide such mental support for frontline staff? Uh, if any of the presenters, panelists want to react to that or um, in at least in the normative sense, what it should be? I'll jump in a little bit. Go um, ahead, Robbie. I, it somewhat relates to the last comment, but um, this idea that people, many people find their worth in their pay. And so identity gets wrapped up in all these things. And because of that, like, and credentialing helps support people think that they should be paid more when they probably should have been paid more before they got the credentialing in the first place. But also the role of leadership, organizational leadership. I mean, there are systematic issues that have to be addressed, but there's also things at the organizational level where the manager, what we found is that they're very important to helping individuals create create meaningfulness in their work. This is a process of trying to understand how these pieces connect and that pay is one of them, but also like the idea that people need to engage in self-care. Self and that comes from leadership taking a stance and saying, it's five o'clock, go home, take off the weekend, not being voluntold to pay to drive to see a client or pay to park or pay to go to conference. I mean, it is an investment and it also requires us to, for government and big funders to really think about uh, like having a line in the budget for taking care of people. Like, and I, I mean, in for some HR practices or HR systems that allow, and not the system itself, but in the way, you know, we have speakers come in and providing people that come into your organization and can for, offer counseling services. I mean, especially for a lot of frontline workers, this is very emotional and they do have high burnout and they're told to take care of themselves. And yet the institution and the funders don't fund that in a, in a line in the budget to take care of your employees, give them a day off every once in a while. And so maybe there is a way that remote and flexible work and arrangements are allowing for some of these things to happen. And that is also something that government has to consider. Are we OK with people not being in the office nine to five anymore? I mean, what does that look like when you happen to report to a funder exactly how many hours each staff member is reporting? in the office place. Like, so there are system issues and organizational approaches that could be applicable here. Robbie, I'm really glad you mentioned um, the, the issue around self-care uh, and what leadership uh, needs to do um, and how, I, I, when I talk to sort of folks that have been, are real veterans of, of, their, uh, of their agencies, they will talk about a time when Every Monday there, you know, everything would stop and there'd be a brown bag lunch and a speaker would come in and there would be some, you know, they would build these sort of learning organizations that had a sense of collaborative, you know, there were collaborative processes, people got to sort of see each other and stuff. I hear, I hear that happening very rarely now. And then when it does happen, it isn't about sort of, you know, a sort of more educational interesting issue. It's about, oh, uh, you know, SAMHSA has just issued a new way of recording our outcome measures, so we need to make sure everybody's on board. So it isn't even fun training. Um, and, and so I think that just that in and of itself is a huge shift away from this sort of collective support culture uh, that, that I think you talk, that you talk about that that in many ways did offset the, the overwork in other areas. And that gets taken away, but the overwork doesn't. Great point. Uh, Robbie, I was hoping that since it's, uh, we are on the, uh, on the related topic, could you talk more about uh, your finding that suggests the relationship really matters a great deal to nonprofit workers? Can you share, uh, can you perhaps share some empirical evidence from your prior study um, that like that made you to make this uh, 
conclusion? I'll jump in a bit to help support Robbie here. Um, so I'm her co-author on, on this research. Um, the finding that we have around uh, relationships and why they still matter to the nonprofit workers that we talked with is that um, in the framing of our research, we know and understand that um, folks find uh, meaning in their work through different avenues. And so sometimes it's being connected to um, being a part of a greater good. They find spiritual meaning or calling in their work. But one of the most prominent that we found amongst the workers that we talked with is this idea of relationships. Um, and this idea that they find nonprofit work to be inherently relational. Um, and I think this, Cheryl, this is something that you spoke to as well and, and carry you as well, um, is that one of the things that they value the most and what they find meaning in, that was one of the questions that we posed uh, to the folks that we interviewed is like, what is meaningful about your work? You know, where do you find meaning? in your work. And a lot of it is is around relationships. And so it's relationships with their coworkers and colleagues, with the partners that they have in the community, um, and certainly with their the beneficiaries of their of their programs, whether they're clients um, or folks coming in to get services from the organization. And so um, what we found is just this a paradoxical relationship, which is that the that these relationships matter greatly to them, uh, which I don't think is surprising um, to any of us. Um, but at the same time, these other things are becoming important to them as well in terms of, you know, like I want to be paid for what I'm worth. Well, you know, I want to know and understand my value to this organization. And, and that's through pecuniary awards, uh, rewards. And I want um, chances for advancement and I want opportunities to be creative. Um, and so it's I think what we're seeing is just a shift in terms of or maybe not. it's not even a shift. Maybe this has existed the whole time and we're just, you know, just now talking about it. But this idea that, you know, Relationships have always mattered to people in the nonprofit sector. It's just um, some of these other things are coexisting along with it at the same time. And I think that when we talk about these issues, it's like, how do we stop um, having this expectation or this assumption that, that that's all that matters to people is that the relationships are the only thing that matters and that this idea of psychic income, the, the reward from doing great work is, is the only thing that matters um, to folks working in the sector. Thank you, Billy, for, for sharing more about it. So uh, I'd like to pause a little bit just to, to uh, give a chance to speakers that, that what are we seeing in the chat? Like if there are any themes that you want to react on the screen just to share with everybody. And I know that, that our speakers have been responding to questions on the chat and Q&A, but please let me know if there are certain questions that you want to share with everybody that I haven't, I might not have seen. Um, so, so there's a one question that, uh, uh, that's uh, not yet answered from Elizabeth Boris. Government contracting with the human service organization is another area that needs reform. Do any of researchers have perspective on this, the government, government contracting with the human service organization? That I know that we already have been talking a lot about how uh, funders should take different approaches, especially government funders should take different approaches to support nonprofit, especially nonprofit staff. But Sherry, since the uh, human service organization is one of your very focused area, do you have a particular perspective that you would like to share with us? And please uh, uh, feel free to jump in if other uh, panelists wanna share some perspectives. Yeah, I'd be actually really curious about what both, uh, what Rusty and Carrie especially think since they probably are swimming in this. Um, I think the problem with um, the current way things are set up and the contract that a lot of the contracting out that's going on in human services, it's, it's contracting out without sufficient funds to actually do the work. So increasingly public institutions are, um, are, are sort of monitoring and pass through to uh, local level um, nonprofits, but th there isn't, there just isn't enough resources also being sort of passed along. So I think it's a, it's a, it's kind of a false equation that folks seem to think is going on that just the money is just all going down into the nonprofit sector to do this work. It's, it's not, it's less money is going to the public sector. And then they in turn are passing on even less uh, into, uh, into these nonprofits. So um I am I am not a fan of of the privatization that that's going on. Um, I think there's a place for for the public sector 
to really reinforce a notion of the common good in partnership with the nonprofit sector. Um, and I think that relationship has really been skewed badly. But I'm going to turn it over to Rusty and Carrie. Um, I can hop in. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on this um, informed by a lot of data. And I would say that I, I would concur completely with everything that Cheryl just said. I think that a lot of times what I've seen in my own research is that contracting out happens with very insufficient resources and with very high demands for very particular kinds of data to be reported back. And so what that results in is a huge culture of processing. Right, that they're basically the frontline workers have a very limited amount of time to spend with each of their clients and they have a very high level of requirement of particular kinds of number counting, being processing data that they need to report back. And so they end up just spending a lot of time filling out a lot of paperwork. And as a result, the clients end up feeling like a number and that they are just getting processed through a large system, right? And so these are people who are already dealing with multiple forms of historic trauma, intergenerational trauma, many of them with criminal records, time with the criminal justice system. Um, and they're trying as hard as they can to, I mean, I saw clients, right? Who are trying to work two, three jobs, and yet they're spending such an, an immense amount of time trying to fill out all of this paperwork so that they can make themselves seen in the system in all the ways that they need to be seen in the system. Um, and it's a highly demoralizing process for clients and um, for the people who are working in those organizations. Whereas organizations that were aiming to do very similar work, but without contracts from government, had much greater leeway um, to be able to spend more time with clients, to actually approach them calling them their names, to be able to ask them what their hopes and dreams were, to joke around a little bit with them and sort of infuse some humanity into their days. And all of these things both improved the experience for the clients so that such that the clients ended up having better outcomes and it greatly improved the work experience for the frontline workers so that they really felt energized and inspired at the end of the day um, by their interactions with their clients. And so I think overall, I would completely concur with you, Elizabeth, that there needs needs to be a large overhaul of this. And I, I agree with Cheryl that I think a lot of it has to do with the combination of limited resources and high reporting requirements it just ends up being a really nasty combination. Um, hey, it's Rusty. I just, I just put in the chat a, a link to the Just Pay website. I wanted to make sure folks know that um, you know there are good people inside New York City government who've been trying to um, improve the way the government contracts with nonprofits, um, both in terms of timeliness, in terms of the, the websites and processes, and in terms of um, paying for quote unquote indirect costs, which is the government way of calling people overhead um, or calling stuff that's not directly a program um, uh, overhead. But anyway, that's been an ongoing process under the previous administration, this administration, things, it took a long time. It was not a neat or clean process. Things got funded and unfunded, um, the, you know, but finally, because of the pandemic and the role of nonprofits in supporting communities and delivering to people during the pandemic, I think the government finally started seeing that how important the nonprofit workforce was in New York City. But in order to get this money back to, to improve um, these indirect costs and really fully pay those real costs that we were talking about earlier, um, the Nonprofit Human Services Council organized, They first of all, they contracted some great political operatives. They created this amazing video that's like a musical um, about a food pantry and this government rep comes to like tout it and the ED is like, uh-uh, you can't come in here and like use us as pawns, just pay. And it, the whole musical is about just pay and the campaign was about just just pay. And um, so they, they, they ended up holding two massive rallies in front of city hall, getting city council members to come speak at these rallies as well as social workers. The crowd of a thousand people or so was all human services workers and nonprofits. Um, so they they built power in numbers and they showed force um, 
it both kind of inside the halls of power, but then in this this literal show of force. So I think it's an important um, story and an important lesson for our sector um, that, that we have collective power and we don't need to be scared to use our voices together as institutions and as leaders uh, to, to begin addressing these issues. And just to add, that was one of the things Jeff, Jeff said at the beginning, right? We need the Bureau of Labor Statistics and big government agencies just to recognize the nonprofit labor force as part of the labor force. I mean, there's just this invisible labor that doesn't even get recognized at a higher level that affects everything. It's a systematic challenge. So, I mean, step one is just recognizing there are people out there doing this work and they represent a large part of the American workforce. Thank you everyone for the reaction. So, so we have a few minutes left for this discussion. So before we wrap up, I would like to post uh, uh, two remaining question, one more big picture question and then one uh, uh, sort of what to do question. So my first question would be, uh, neoliberalism is certainly not just about the nonprofit sector, but it's a cultural belief in every part of our society. Given that neoliberalism is a long embedded idea everywhere, uh, which is certainly opposed to the mission driven nature of the nonprofit sector, how could we as a sector encourage everyone to recognize this cultural tension and make the se sector shift away from the recent celebration of market based approaches? So, so this is more like, um, bigger picture, some of philosophical question that I wanted to pose to the panel and another more. So so what's the takeaway from this uh, is that I will use a question coming from one of the uh, attendees that Louis for that um, the question for the panel, if people join nonprofit work because of meaningful work, its mission, but if people can easily shift from motivation as fixers, to less motivated processors, is it pay or increased pay that is the appropriate labor to keep people motivated? Or is it something more along the lines of increasing psychic pay and recognition for their work? Or would it be a mix of those two? Or So what would be the motivator to keep these people to remain as fixers rather than becoming processors? So these are two, um, questions that I want you to post to the panelists, whichever you want to pick up. And I just would love to hear your reactions to this. Like, so what, what do we do? Thanks, Mary. I, um, I'd love to pick up the second question first in terms of what we do, although I find the first question fascinating. Um, uh, I actually have some a, a few working papers out right now that use some new methods on nonprofit data. And what we do is on really large data sets, we look at both people's preferences for particular attributes in their work environment, and then people's experiences of those attributes in their work environment. And then look at how those are related to a third sort of dependent variable. In this particular case, we're looking at job satisfaction. Um, and what it helps us really find is that across a whole range of different job attributes, there's actually only one job attribute that we find that's sort of equally appreciated by all employees, and that's job security. It turns out that if you increase job security for your employees, regardless of your employees' preference for job security, they will all be equally appreciative of that and their job satisfaction will increase. But it turns out for the other five job attributes that we looked at, and we looked at whether people find their work interesting, how much autonomy people have, whether they want to work with other people, whether they're helping people on the job, right? A range of different things, um, their financial security, right? What we find actually is that people's job satisfaction varies because people have different motivational profiles. And I think sometimes we look for this kind of one size fits all answer um, to help us understand what's going on, but it turns out actually that, that people vary. And so sometimes when people um, want to help other people, increasing their salary actually decreases their job satisfaction. And you know, these are some sort of counterintuitive findings. Whereas, you know, if, if that's not a huge preference for people, then increasing their salary increases their job satisfaction. And so I think part of what we need to move away from is this idea that there's going to be like 
one magic thing that switches it for our whole entire workforce. And I think hopefully to a more nuanced approach to understanding um, who are our employees? What do they care about? What motivates them? You know, and thinking about this both on the hiring end. So like, what is the profile of this particular position going to look like? Okay, so we need to find somebody for whom these things are motivating. And how can we then develop a screening process that helps us sort of evaluate whether candidates are like this. Um, and then I think if we already have employees, we can really think about socialization tactics that, you know, help people to appreciate particular aspects of work, right? There's a, a large body of research out there on socialization as an effective way um, to help people sort of start to appreciate the things that are around them. I think to sort of the broader question of like, how do we keep people as fixers and have them not, you know, move into becoming processors. You know, I think that there's a much broader question then of what are the cultures that our organizations exist within more broadly? What are the stipulations that they're managing from their funders? And then what are the cultures that we create within organizations as leaders and as managers in terms of the kind of place that we're creating for our employees to work? Because I think that makes a very large difference in terms of, we know that across sectors, the, the most important thing that influences people's job satisfaction is their relationship with their supervisor, right? That's been proven again and again and again. And so if we think about what kind of culture are we creating within organizations and how can we make that a culture that supports people, um, that actually reaches out in individualized ways to people, that doesn't make them do really tedious, meaningless tasks um, because they have to do that you know, to, to meet a funder's needs, right? So how can we sort of start reforming it? And I think the important piece of that is that we also can't just pinch that on organizational leadership the funders and the funding organizations need to understand their role in that as well. Um, and so I think it's a multi-tiered multi process, but I think it's exciting to think about the fact that people are increasingly interested in these questions, that we're not just sort of trying to minimize overhead and you know, get away with the least amount of investment into the workforce as possible. And we can really think about it on an individual level, on a leadership level, um, on an organizational culture level, and on a funding level as to how we can start to reform this to make it a more sustainable and engaging place for people to work so that we can do more effective work with, with clients and beneficiaries and the sort of mission of the organizations. Thanks, uh, Sherry. I think you wanted to jump in, but you are on mute. Yeah, there we go. Um, I was going to say it's interesting that you started with the notion of job security as the as the sort of touchstone for for workers. And what got me initially into this work for looking at the workforce was a number of my students when they finished their MSWs could not get permanent jobs. The only thing that the sector was offering were were contingency or fee for service jobs, uh, which, which really disconnects them. It, it does everything you don't want to have happen in a human service agency. They're not, they're not there. They're not part of the culture. They're very disconnected from coworkers. They're often having to hold multiple multiple jobs because they only get paid if their client shows up. Um, and and so I think part of it is to really look at how as agencies uh, we are offering job security because um, you know contingency work often gets sold as flexibility but it's only flexible if you have the resources to enjoy that flexibility and out of the like 40 folks I interviewed only two and that was because their partners had really good jobs with really good benefits said, yeah, this works well, I can be home, I can schedule my work around when the kids come home. But for, especially for newly minted MSWs, it was, it was a, it was an absolute career killer. Um, and, you know, they're, they're pulling out, they don't want to, they, this, so this is what they think the work is about. Um, so I think the second point is to really, I think as part of our educational missions, we need to really sort of help our students and probably our colleagues as well, understand the current dynamics of, in my case, human service work or, you know, in a larger and the nonprofits, that the naivete about, I can just go out and do good work um, 
is is still very pronounced among uh, at least my students. And they, you know, they want to do that. And it's a really wonderful thing to sort of be in a classroom with 20 people all saying, you know, I'm committed to X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's a real gut punch when they hit agency life um, and they're not prepared for it. Um, and so it's like, how do we help bring that also uh, into the, for those of us doing university-based work, how do we bring that into our courses and curriculums as well? I couldn't agree more with that particular point, um, as well as this idea, I think the larger issue that Lewis raised around the impact of neoliberalism. I mean, I think that that's part of, part of our task as those who are working in higher ed or working with, you know, uh, training um, those who are working in nonprofit organizations is to begin to question and to help them begin to question critically some of the assumptions that we make about what constitutes good nonprofit work and, and how nonprofit work can look. You know, that it's that there are other ways of thinking about and doing nonprofit work that don't necessarily have to be greatly informed by, you know, a growth imperative at, at all times and reporting requirements. And, you know, that there are other ways of thinking about nonprofit work and be able to do good work, but it doesn't necessarily have to look like this. And I think the second point I, I wanted to make is, is um, you know, this question came up in terms of, you know, what can people do? How can contractors support, uh, you know, the mental health and self-care of workers? And I think we can't talk about those kinds of issues unless we talk, you know, wrap that up in this uh, associated conversation about the real cost of labor and also this idea of contingent labor. Part-time contracts is like these are positions that don't come with health benefits. So people can literally can't take advantage um, of, of uh, healthcare services and counseling and whatever it is they might need to deal with some of these stress and workplace issues because they don't have access to them um, or they have to pay out of pocket for them. So I think, you know, there's there's no, as, as Carrie very eloquently said, there's no one solution here. It has to happen at all of these different levels um, in order to address um, some of these intractable problems that neoliberalism has been posing for the last 50 years. Thanks everybody for sharing your reactions to my questions. And Rusty, do you wanna share your last thoughts before we transition to Lynette? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, I, I just have really enjoyed being, being part of this. I think, um, you know, research I, I put in the chat, this um, professor at Berkeley, um, who's written about burnout and studied burnout. And she found, she clearly found that institutional issues impact individual burnout. So we can't keep treating it as an individual matter um, and we need institutional solutions. And, and she talks about things like, you know, autonomy and team empowerment and, you know, showing loyalty to our employees as employers, um, things things like that. And, um, can help institutions to, um, you know, empower their employees, motivate employees, and stave off burnout. Uh, and too often in the nonprofit world, we are talking about burnout both as an, in, an individual issue, and we're talking about it as how do we recover from it, rather than how do we help to help people uh, have, uh, to avoid it. So um, I'm, I'm really glad that independent sector and Arnova and all of the scholars here have taken up this issue, this critical issue that, as I said at the beginning, is an existential threat to our people, our institutions, and our missions. Thank you, everyone, for making a wonderful presentation. And I return to Lynette now. Great. Thank you, uh, Murray and Rusty, and to all of our wonderful presenters. Um, and thanks to the audience for your great questions and your insights. You, you've really helped me think a little bit differently about this issue. And frankly, I'm, I'm energized on the one hand that there's um, a shared experience of, wow, we're really in trouble and we really need to change how we're setting up organizations and interacting with the folks who are on the ground doing the work. You know, it's interesting. A lot of folks who go into the nonprofit sector do so because they want to help other people. And we need to constantly remind them and ourselves that it's also important for them to, to engage in self-care. So 
now that we have this sort of shared sense of what are the issues right now that, that our nonprofit workforce is facing and what does the research say both about what's going on and about potential recommendations and those challenges, we're gonna focus now on policy and practice recommendations to both incentivize and improve the nonprofit sector work. I encourage you to think about what you're hearing in the next section how it can apply to your everyday work. I'd like to hand things over now to Emily Rogers, Independent Sectors Manager of Policy Research to get us started with our second section, You've Got a Passion and a Vision, Incentivizing and Improving Nonprofit Sector Work. Thanks, Lynette. Um, we've got some fantastic research that we're gonna highlight in this section that has some immediate implications for practice. Um, and I'm excited to introduce our presenters. We'll be hearing from Michael Ringenbach, who's the Vice President of Development at the Whitaker Center for the Arts and Sciences. In addition to his full-time work as a practitioner in the sector, he's also a PhD student studying organization management at Penn State University. Samantha Plotner is a PhD student in the Department of Public Administration at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her research focuses on improving nonprofit workplaces and operational capacity building. In addition to her PhD studies, she is a part-time associate director at Arabella Advisors, where she creates learning and development programming. Dr. Ruth Sessler Bernstein is an associate professor of nonprofit management at Pepperdine University, teaching nonprofit management classes and the service leadership capstone course. Her publication and research interests focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in leadership and governance with an emphasis on nonprofit organizations. So let's kick off these presentations with Michael. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Ringenbach. I serve um, mostly as, as a practitioner in my full-time work um, leading the development of the Arts and Science Center in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. My contribution to this uh, symposium is is putting together a piece about young workers and the practical considerations about working with recent college graduates in the nonprofit field. Uh, if you take a look at polling data, data survey data, uh, young people today do want to get engaged in, in the world. They do want to be involved and they do want to make a positive impact. However, some of that same polling data uh, also suggests that the number one concern of, of young graduates coming out of college is their financial stability and their ability to um, you know, build families and, and to build an, a nice life uh, to moving forward. And this, you know, can have really big considerations for nonprofit work. Maybe individuals, young graduates who come into the field who are idealistic, but then they hit, hit the non and they start in the nonprofit sector, but they don't have a great experience. And then they're unable to uh, financially support themselves. Um, they're unable to provide for their families. And they're unable to advance in, in the career as they anticipated, and which um, can be worrisome. It might sour their, their expectations um, or, or sour their entire uh, field. So what I, I focused on are some practical tips as a practitioner, as a leader, as an executive in an organization about how to work with particularly young employees, recent college graduates, uh, to en enhance their experience. Uh, I, I do address that policy uh, implications and policy approaches can be helpful. There, there could be policy approaches with student loan forgiveness, uh, with, with grant funding opportunities. Uh, however, those, those policy approaches might take a while working in the Pennsylvania State Capitol of Harrisburg. We see policies put in place that take five years to implement after putting in place. And it just, um, so, so my focus is on how do we, um, as managers, as leaders of nonprofit organizations, what are some of the changes that we can make right now to enhance the experience of young employees? And that, and that in includes a few things. Um, the first is advocating for staff in investment, um, ensuring that board, board members, corporate donors, um, and even other leadership members understand that in order to retain the best talent, in order to 
to grow uh, young employees, there has to be a significant staff investment. And I know a lot of the practitioner, practitioners and researchers just talked about this and did an excellent job. Um, there are some other things that leaders can control as well. One of which is, is the communication, making sure that you're setting expectation early with young employees, um, letting them know about the tasks that they should be performing, being intentional about communicating clearly, um, you know, ensuring that the tasks that they have are well laid out, the expectations that they have for their career are well laid out, and also making sure that you have a plan in place for what a promotion opportunity, uh, promotion opportunities could look like. And additionally, for young employees, especially those who may not have any professional experience, making sure there's a really clear onboarding practice in place for your organization. Organizations Nonprofit organizations often don't have enough resources. They often don't have enough time, but ensuring that employees can maximize those resources really can further uh, their experience. Nonprofit leaders also should be um, creating a culture of empowerment um, and leaning into the fact that many nonprofit organizations have the opportunity for younger employees to learn faster than maybe their for-profit counterparts or the government counterparts that have many, um, you know, bureaucratic structures in place. So ensuring that you're maximizing the opportunities to learn, ensuring that you're empowering young employees to maybe try out different areas. Uh, say they work in marketing, but you you let them work in with events, or if they're in the finance department and let them try out in marketing. Really allowing young employees to grow um, is an is important. And the last one is, is making sure that you have an equitable and, diverse and culturally inclusive workplace. Uh, younger generation and, and younger employees, um, you know, deserve, just like every employee, to, to work in a workplace filled with respect and appreciation. And this is even more of an expectation for the young workforce coming in. So ensuring that your, cult, your workplace is culturally appropriate, culturally inclusive, uh, and welcoming for all can really make young employees first foray into the nonprofit world a, a really uh, a good experience. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Up next, we have Samantha Flotner. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting about a survey I did of 184 millennials with nonprofit work experience. Um, so to start, why should you care about millennials? Um, which is the cohort who are currently between the ages of 26 and 41. Um, a whole bunch of reasons, but the main two are, one, they are the largest generation in the American workforce. And two, they approach work differently than earlier generations. And a big part of this is that they are, as a whole, fed up with the status quo of work, regardless of sector. But it turns out that when you ask them, they have a range of ideas for how their nonprofit workplaces could be improved. And the main theme that emerges is that respondents want the kinds of changes that make working in nonprofits viable for the long term. You know, while mission matters to them and it matters to them really deeply, um, they seem less likely to buy into this idea that the mission is more important than absolutely anything else. Um, which is a, reflecting a shift that has been observed in a whole bunch of recent work on nonprofit employee motivation, including some of what we've talked about today already. And the desired changes fit into sort of these two broad categories, uh, changes to compensation and benefits and organizational changes. Um, and what may surprise many of you is that it was organizational changes that came up with more frequency and urgency than changes to compensation and benefits. And those are primarily concerned with issues around workloads and organizational culture. And I'm happy to get more into the weeds of that um, during the Q&A portion, but overall, there are some clear takeaways for nonprofit leaders who are considering how to recruit and retain millennial talent. One, make sure that all of your employees are making a living wage for their area that covers the cost of their benefits. Multiple respondents noted that they wanted to make more money to afford their co-pays for their employer-offered health insurance. 
um, right? If, if your folks are not making enough money to afford the health insurance, you're, you're doing something wrong there. Um, to make sure that everyone has adequate PTO where they can actually disconnect from work. And this is more about culture than benefits. It's more about just the number of days you're providing people. It's about making sure that people can actually like be disconnected, right? Which we know is important for folks' mental health, especially in these like stressful frontline jobs. Um, you know, millennials don't wanna be answering emails or jumping onto a quick call when they're supposed to be on vacation. Um, and it's also really important to make sure that leaders are modeling that behavior. Um, it's really hard to believe that you can actually unplug on vacation if your boss is not doing the same thing, if your boss's boss is not doing the same thing, right? Uh, and three, make sure how you treat your employees aligns with your mission and values as an organization. Some of the harshest words from survey respondents were aimed at managers and organizations who respondents felt were discriminatory, hypocritical, or who didn't back up their words with concrete action, right? Hearing about organizations that, you know, we provide low-cost mental health support, right? That's what we do. It's the mission of our organization. And our employer offered health insurance has terrible mental health coverage. We are an organization that advocates for reproductive rights, but we don't provide adequate parental leave. Um, all of those sorts of things. Um, millennials just really are not having it when it comes to that. It's not enough to say the right things. You have to be doing the right things in how you are treating your staff. Um, and to close, while millennials are the focus of this work, the changes that they're advocating for benefit everybody and will make nonprofits more attractive long-term career prospects for all potential employees, uh, regardless of age. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Molly. Thanks, Samantha. Um, as a millennial, I can definitely relate to some of your findings. Um, finally, we have uh, Dr. Ruth Bernstein. I think you might be on mute. <clears throat> I am on, and I'm also sharing my screen. So just give me a moment here to make this full size. What is everybody seeing? There we go. So uh, good afternoon. I'm really honored to be here speaking with all of these other wonderful contributors to the field. I'm gonna take a slightly different turn. I'm gonna look at policies and practices that promote hiring and retention, particularly with respect to underrepresented groups and nonprofit organizations. My co-author on this paper is Paul Salaponte from Case Western Reserve University, and he's unable to join us today due to travels. So one could ask, why has there not been more progress in the many decades that we've been talking about uh, racial equity in the United States? And we would argue that the past and current situations are really uh, exclusionary for many identity groups. And this is because of institutionalized practices and employment systems that exist in our organizations. We've been focusing in more recent decades on representational diversity, but not on how people can get along with one another. We've also been focusing in our organizations on ineffective and counterproductive uh, actions, such as mandatory diversity and awareness training, job tests for promotion to management, performance evaluations, and grievance uh, procedures that are inequitable. We've also been focusing on education. So one could imagine a diversity or awareness training that lasts an hour, not on changing people's behaviors. There's also very prominently anti-inclusive practices that I'll delve into in a moment that reflect prejudice and reproduce inequities. And therefore we have not been focusing on what we feel is the most important thing, which is meaningful inclusive interactions and how people actually behave towards one another. And secondarily, a second strand, which is there's been a very, uh, large lack of focus on the equity when considering promotion, pay, 
and termination decisions. So we can look at this as two different cycles or a number of different cycles, both virtuous cycles and vicious cycles. So if you can think about what happens when we have inequities and misallocation of human capital, but we're just continuing to promote those. And what we find is that there are anti-inclusive practices of self-segregation, of interaction uh, discomfort. And these prevent people from even engaging with people who are dissimilar to them that there's tremendous amount of stereotyping and stigmatizing that exists. And of course, the more difficult one to tackle, the implicit biases. And the result of these is that we have people being stuck in low job uh, areas. And of course, that results in a competitive disadvantage for the organization. Where conversely, if we can create a virtuous cycle where that inter initial discomfort of interacting with others is overcome, then people start to build trust and comfort and work together. And as they do, talent is utilized more effectively. We benefit from everybody's contributions and expertise. And at the same time, we learn new skills by interacting with people who have had vastly different experiences in their lives. And we also would like to note that leaders, and we see this throughout the organizations from uh, employee levels to, to leadership levels, where we can focus this as performance-centered because it, the inclusive interactions do build better performance outcomes instead of focusing these changes on diversity themselves. So how do we do this? Well, we have a framework for inclusive interactions. These, and I just wanna quickly share this with you. If we begin with organizational conditions that support inclusion, that simply means that the organization has minimally instituted some kind of representational diversity where there's lived programs for and values, they've stated values that they support diversity and inclusion. But what happens so commonly is with this emphasis just on representation, that people are uncomfortable and therefore they don't engage well together and they have increased infrequent superficial interactions. And those are fueled in that vicious loop by those anti-inclusive practices that I mentioned of cell segregation, interaction discomfort, stereotyping and stigmatizing and implicit bias. And then you get into a vicious cycle where the anti-inclusive practices further inhibit interactions. But this can be interrupted and moved to an emphasis instead on inclusion. And we argue that six structured inclusive interaction practices, which do not focus on diversity, but focus on improved performance, will make a very big difference driving inclusive interactions. And these six practices are pursuing a shared mission or task orientation, mixing members so that you get to know everybody, collaborating together, forcing the type of project to be collaborative, having policies and practices in place for handling tensions and conflicts, engaging comfortably with one another and providing opportunity for equitable insider status. If we do this, then and in, uh, instituting these practices, drives the inclusive interactions, which overcome, if you will, the anti-inclusive practices. It enables people to question their pre-existing stereotypes and replace them with new beliefs based on these positive, meaningful interactions. As a result, people learn together. When they learn together, then they want to engage again because those stereotypes are busted. A second strand here is that 
merit and accountability practices have to be dealt with. This is where we have to hire equitably. We have to provide the same opportunities for promotions and trainings and ultimately uh, pay equally. If merit and accountability practices are in place, there's oversight of these personnel decisions and individuals are behaving uh, interacting inclusively and learning from one another, then we get to a point where we have sustainable inclusion, which includes equity amongst the members, enhanced group and organizational performance, individual skill development, building of an inclusive culture, and organizational commitment to retention. So if you will, we have another virtuous loop whereby we come back around the merit and accountability practices, the adaptive learning, and we just drive these loops over and over. So what are the implications? Well, our specified inclusion and accountability practices basically takes vicious cycles that per, uh, perpetuate prejudice and stereotyping and stigmatizing into virtuous cycles that build inclusion and equity. We have to keep in mind that this is not an end goal, but it's an ongoing process. It is not something we can check off our list as ever finished. It has to be core and central to all of our organizations and organizational decisions. So that is my conclusion and I'd like to thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, you all have given us a lot to think about here, and to help us kind of dig into what we've heard, I'd like to welcome Linda Nguyen, Founder and Executive Director of Movement Talent. Movement Talent was launched in 2020 to introduce a new way of finding, supporting, and maximizing talent for our movements in the U.S. Through Movement Talent, Linda has worked with over 60 organizations and hundreds of applicants in just over two years. Known for her ability to work across movements and to connect people and ideas, Linda brings hands-on experience and insight. Welcome, Linda. Thanks so much, Emily, and to Independent Sector, Arnova. Hey, Linda, I think you inadvertently muted yourself. Oh, sorry about that. Um, just saying thank you um, to all of you, um, to IS, to Arnova, to Nonprofit Policy Forum, and the paper presenters for all their really provocative research. Um, just want to share a little bit more about um, what Movement Talent does, and then wanted to lead a little bit of a discussion amongst the researchers here, um, many of whom are practitioners as well, um, to be able to delve in more into their research and findings. Um, so at Movement Talent, we really take um, an ecosystem approach to building strong staffs for organizations, and we primarily focus on organizations advancing social, racial, economic, um, gender, environmental justice in the United States. And we do this in three key ways, um, one through really honest guidance for applicants and candidates. Um, we find that when we're able to provide people with honest information about staff and workplace culture um, and get having a little bit of a pulse on the various employers and a window into that um, before someone accepts um, a position, um, we can greatly uh, minimize, I think, some of the issues that you know we've heard about today um, when people are um, coming into some of these organizations. Um, who are made up of humans, right? And humans are complex. And so um, people need to have more information to decide if, if that um, workplace is for them or not. The second way we really um, try to build strong staffs um, ecosystem-wide is really engaging in lasting capacity building um, with employers. And so uh, working directly with organizations and their HR and talent teams to look at organizational chart issues, to do talent planning, um, to really improve their hiring um, processes, um, interview and selection processes, and just full um, talent cycle issues. Um, and we really believe that equipping organizations 
um, with that from the start, as opposed to like single um, organization, single single rule searches, is really the way to um, address some of these longer term issues um, in the field. And lastly, um, we really encourage and promote cross fertilization across movement spaces, and so. Um, we are testing out some shared applicant pools between organizations um, for a collective, more collective approach with scouting, recommendations, referrals, and transfers um, to really um, emphasize that um, retention also is not just retention within organizations, single organizations, but also retention, you know, movement or cause or issue wide. Um, and that people, you know, like change and sometimes want to move um, into different spaces to grow and develop themselves. Um, and so those are the ways, ways, you know, movement talent really works um, around building strong staff bodies. And I just want to comment, you know, um, before we get into um, some more discussion questions, uh, around, you know, much of what has been presented here, you know, definitely things, um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm hearing, you know, things I've experienced myself um, within organizations. I will say, though, that, you know, the, the nonprofit sector is very vast. You know, we've heard some of the numbers earlier on today. And then I think some of the deficiencies lifted up um, around some of these organizations um, I think are really balanced by some bright spots um, in other nonprofit organizations who are innovating on policies and practices um, that really promote healthy, trauma-informed, equitable, loving, caring workplaces. So I just want to, you know, lift that up as well, because I think we can learn um, a lot from each other about what are the things that we are doing well um, to be able to advance um, more um, you know, whole and healthy um, places to work um, for the workforce. I wanted to um, go into some questions and, you know, happy for Sam and Michael and Ruth to jump in or um, take turns as, as needed. Um, but, you know, one of the things um, I really wanted to get at was really what are you finding as the biggest disconnect between what earlier career staff um, want from their workplace, and then um, actually what they're getting. I can start. I think, I think one of the biggest disconnects is that what young, what millennial employees are asking for, um, and what they value in their workplaces is different than what earlier generations have valued, right? And so I think if you are still making decisions based on sort of what like you personally value, if you're someone who's like a baby boomer or Gen X, um, that trade-off between like what I'm getting out of my work, what I'm getting out of my personal life, um, millennials have what's called lower work centrality. So like their jobs are less sort of central to their, their self-identity. And so I think that that's something organizations really have to think about is that Millennials are not finding their sole meaning in life just through their jobs anymore in the way that some earlier generations did. I think Samantha did a really nice job there. I, I'd like to add to that when you think about recent college graduates who are entering the workforce, um, many who enter the not the for-profit workforce, especially large consulting firms or, or big companies, have a fairly defined career path. If, they're a consultant, for example, they'll do two years as an analyst and I'll become a senior analyst and I'll become X, Y, and Z. And in the nonprofit workforce, some of the larger nonprofit organizations are doing a good job of defining career ladders, but smaller nonprofit organizations um, might not have the capacity or, or the bandwidth or, or the foresight to, to set up what a career ladder looks like. And I, I think um, that can lead to maybe, uh, you know, discontent among among younger employees. Thanks so much, both of you. Um, I also wanted to ask um, if any of you were able to find, you know, what consistent resources, um, you know, Michael, you talk about these staff ladders, uh, you know, available to some organizations and not to others. But have you found any consistent research resources, any of you um, available to organizational leaders really to better address some of these staff concerns and discontent? I, I think um, 
it, it can be tough for nonprofit organizations to afford uh, different benchmarking studies. If you take a look at some HR ladders or, or benchmarking studies, they can be hundreds of dollars to purchase and there might not be room in the budget to, to do comparisons. So uh, at, at least for me, and I, I realize there's 1.6 million nonprofits in the United States, so I'm just speaking from one experience. It's been talking to peer uh, to peer uh, nonprofits and and kind of discussing uh, what what those patterns look like. Um, different, you know, there's different uh, resource groups in in the fundraising world. For example, AFP is is very helpful, but it's mostly talking to to peers in similar positions. Sam and Ruth, do you have um, any? offerings here? Honestly, Linda, the work that you all are doing is some of really what I've seen is, you know, really trying to um, help organizations with these questions, because a lot of those resources just don't exist otherwise. I agree. And then um, this, you know, this is for Ruth, but, um, you know, can also be for Sam and Michael as well. But, um, you know, wanted to ask if you in your research, Ruth, um, did find any um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts um, within organizations that um, you're familiar with that are, are sort of bright spots and things to be lifted up. You're on mute, Ruth. Sorry. <laughs> The answer is absolutely yes. The research we did for our book, the book I did with Paul Salpente and Judy Weisinger, we specifically researched and interviewed and tracked down examples where this happens and flourishes and use those to build from instead of looking at the negative examples. So while it is not very common, it does exist. And maybe we could say, is there one or two that are absolutely perfect? Maybe. But we drew from many, many interviews and many organizations what the common good aspects were. And uh, there was no question. One of the things that kept coming up was the organizations needed to go to their boards and go to their leaders, if we were in the for-profit sector as well, or government sector, we expand that that it had to be sold as performance. It was only in very recent times that we started finding organizations where they're driven just, and, and that is mostly in the nonprofit sector, to model and to be driven to be exemplary and DEI. And Sam, I wanted to um, thank you so much, Ruth. I wanted to go back to this point that you made around work centrality, because I think it, you know, it raises, I think, a question for some people around, okay, so if millennials um, have lower levels of work centrality, um, what are their expectations sort of outsized then around what the organizations should provide um, to balance, you know, some of their demands? And I don't think their expectations are outsized, right? I think a lot of this has to do with um, the growing conversation around burnout, right? And the growing conversation um, just around like what it, like what do you want your like life to actually look like, right? In regards to your job. Um, and Helen Peterson has written a lot about this. <laughs> um, and it's something I think has resonated with a lot of millennials. I think contextually, it's important to remember that millennials entered the workforce in the wake of the Great Recession or in the middle of the Great Recession. And they as a whole um, are on track to be the first generation since the Great Depression to be less well off than their parents were. Um, and that has fundamentally changed a lot of their attitudes about work, right? They have, they don't have the same expectations of loyalty. They're not going to be as loyal to an employer because they know the employer is not going to be as loyal to them. And so I think, it, you know, people started calling it quiet quitting. That's like a misnomer, right? I think it's just understanding that like your employees want to have a life outside of their jobs. And 
I don't think that that is an unrealistic thing for them to be asking for, right? Like when I was looking at what people were asking for, they're not saying like, I want to work 15 hours a week and get paid like I'm working 80, right? They're like, I want to be able to like pick up my kids from school. I want to be able to like disconnect on the weekends, right? I want to be able to have dinner with my spouse, right? And like, these are not unrealistic things they're asking for. I think sometimes it gets twisted when we talk about the great resignation or like younger workers are entitled. But when you actually like ask millennials what they want, um, a lot of it is pretty low hanging fruit, right? Not to, like not calling your employees while they're on vacation, right? Like that doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> um, and so I think there's some like expectation mismatch happening here too um, about what that lower work centrality actually means. Like when they're at work, they're working really hard. You know, they appreciate what they do. They find real meaning in that work. They just don't want that work to be the only thing that they're doing in their life. Um, you mentioned burnout, Sam, and, you know, from, you know, my experience in working with a number of, you know, leaders and organizations, I think burnout amongst executive directors in particular is just, it's, it's been quite, you know, acute, um, especially over the last few years. And, you know, wanted to ask this group, uh, you know, what, what is being done, I think, to, I think supplement, you know, um, organization leaders' efforts um, to remedy. I think a lot of um, what we're hearing today, um, in the midst of, you know, they're also experiencing um, the pressures and really trauma of, you know, the pandemic and lots of other things, um, unrest, political unrest, social unrest, like all over the world. Um, do you feel like there's enough there and? Um, what have you seen in your research around this? I could speak to that a little bit. Um, what I what we've seen is in many of the organizations we talk to, diversity, equity, and inclusion was not driven by the leadership, but is actually being driven from the employees upwards. And this, of course, is becoming more and more so in the past few years with the political unrest, but that it is very easy at the work group, group level, at a team level, to institute these inclusive practices and to say, look, look what we've done. Look how much our performance has increased. Look how much we've improved our workplace. And then forcing the boards to emulate them. Absolutely. I, I think a big part uh, with um, nonprofits, too, is there's always more work that you can do. An inherent challenge is, is there's an unlimited amount of work. There's so you know many donors I want to talk to, many partnerships I want to build, and just don't have the time to get to right now. Um, so ensuring that the boards and leadership team have clear expectations of what a work week looks like or what a work day looks like to ensure that employees aren't burning themselves out and that leadership isn't burning themselves out um, it is really important it comes down to clear goal setting and, and clear expectations and the nice thing about setting clear expectations is that that doesn't require a grant that doesn't necessarily require money is that that is leadership being intentional about about what they want to do and then being able to communicate that with the board and then also their employees about setting that that in in process um, may, and there could be tension with the board especially if the team isn't achieving what it wants to but setting that clear expectation can really help um, prevent burnout and this is a spot i think where you know boards and funders play a really important role right i the vast majority of my respondents were folks who were sort of in that that middle management role but i did have one former executive director who was a millennial who said I was trying to do all of these things to make work better for my staff and I was getting no backup from my board. Um, and so her biggest hurdle to trying to make the organization a better place to work to try to mitigate her own burnout was the board. Um, you know, and also I worked at nonprofits before I went back to get my doctorate and I am sure I'm far from the only person on this call who has had a funder reach out for a proposal 
and be like, I want this in two days. And it's something that, you know, is going to take you hours and hours of work to do, or, you know, funders who expect reports that take weeks and weeks of effort to put together when that's really not necessary. Um, and so I think there's really a space for boards and funders to be thinking about what they are asking the organizations they fund, the organizations that they support um, to do for them. And the ways in which those structures can then be used to sort of take some of the burden off of, you know, nonprofit staff and nonprofit leaders. I would say another issue that has come up with my students, and I just listened to the prior session, of course, with uh, nodding my head as I have students working multiple jobs and uh, trying to make their way in the sector. And it's just so disheartening. But one of the big issues I come across is the international students who need a job that will sponsor them. Not only is that, ex, you know, it's an expense and, and a commitment for the organization to, to take on somebody and know that after a year, they have to sponsor them and go through the time and financial commitment to do that. And otherwise, these students are leaving the U.S. and they want to work here and they want to contribute. And sometimes when you have nonprofits who are willing to sponsor those students, depending on the type of visa they're trying to get, um, they can enter the lottery and then not get the visa. Um, so that that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole topic we could, that could be its whole own webinar. I know there's um, a number of questions uh, from the audience um, and we should get to those shortly. I just wanted to ask one last question um, to the group around uh, just the mismatch in expectations and whether that is more of the issue um, for you know people working in these organizations and then not always um, having you know their expectations matched. Do you think um, you know the nonprofit sector um, you know, has an image issue, um, has like an inability to um, really present itself in its best light and um, in an honest light, in a transparent light, so that people um, can do a little bit more of the learning and understanding and vetting for themselves um, before they, you know, enter a workplace um, to understand more the realities, you know. The, the aspirations of the organization, but also like the real day-to-day -day challenges. Like, um, you know, maybe it is um, a place where you are gonna have to put in um, long, hard hours, but maybe that organization also has like a really generous flex policy, flex time policy or something like that. Do you think that is um, part of the issue and how big of an issue do you think that is? I mean, I think there's a huge, there you go first, Michael. <laughs> no, you, you go ahead. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge issue, right? Um, my survey was trying to get folks who also have left the sector. So you're not having that like survivor bias of like just the people who stayed put. And I heard both from people who have left and people who are staying and are and want to leave. And they have developed this perception that nonprofit organizations are toxic. Um, that was you know, nonprofit organizations, they say that they're for all these progressive things. They say they're trying to do all this good stuff. They're terrible places to work. And I would rather work in a company that is being honest with me about what they're about, what they're doing, that isn't like cloaking themselves in this idea of we're trying to change the world. And I think that just ends up being really hard for the organizations that are doing the right thing, because you then have to fight this perception of folks who get burned at like two, three, four organizations. And then they're just like, I'm done. Um, like I'm leaving the sector entirely. I'm never doing this again. Um, and that becomes like a huge, like that reputation is a huge talent retention issue for the sector as a whole. And, and while there, there's a lot that managers can do right now, um, some of these sy systematic policy shifts and really the, the funding shifts to allow for uh, maybe the better retention and recruitment of employees is, is vital. Um, year to year budgets for nonprofits can be scary. Uh, and you take a look at some how funders will sometimes fund. Uh, you can get one grant and then not apply for another three years. Uh, well, how does that 
how does that policy or how does that funding model ensure um, sustainability for the organization? So working uh, with government funders, foundation funders, private donors, corporations, to ensure that nonprofit employee salaries, uh, similar to what Rusty was saying earlier, can be covered, um, but really to be able to invest for the long term and not just a year over year budget, I think would really help change the perception of the sector. Thank you, all of you. Emily, um, are we gonna open it up to the greater audience and how would you like us to facilitate this part? Absolutely, yeah, we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, and it looks like we've got some questions from the audience ready. Um, as a reminder to the audience, you can submit your questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A box and, or the chat, submit your reflections in the chat. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question um, on audio or video, just raise your virtual hand. Um, so while you're thinking about your questions, I'd like you to also think about what's the most interesting thing that you've heard so far and what's something that didn't resonate with your experience. So while you're thinking about that, I actually have a question that I'm gonna, I'm gonna take advantage of here. Um, you know, and Michael, you're, you mentioned um, that there are policy solutions that could make a difference, but it's gonna be a long time to actually see that impact. Um, and this question's for all of you. What are some policy solutions that we could be advocating on now um, in order to try and get that ball rolling? I, I can respond, take, take a stab, not necessarily respond, take a stab. It has to be HR issues. The first thing is to be very transparent and equitable. We have an example in our book where we talk about a higher education a university where uh, state universities, the salaries are published. And at the end of the day, within a similar uh, title, they published, well, it was for assistant professors, and they found that at the bottom of the pay scale was all women over 40. Now, the women over 40 were not producing any less, and some of them were superstars in their teaching and in their scholarship. But despite the mandatory forms you filled out, the meeting with your supervisors, there still was nobody looking over the shoulder of the final decision maker. So that it was one individual whose implicit biases made a difference for those women over 40. This can't go on. We have to have fair practices. We have to provide opportunities for absolutely everybody at every level. And I could give more detailed stories if one was so inclined. I, I think some of the policy solutions that you could advocate uh, for now is, I, I know student loan forgiveness um, was, was a big one that was um, obviously has been very uh, popular in the last, last year or so as a, a discussing is there even more forgiveness available for public sector or nonprofit workers to help eliminate the burden? There's a 10 year gap for forgiveness, uh, which is fairly significant in, in, this, in this workforce. Are there state tax credits or different credits at different levels that can be given to nonprofit uh, employees or organizations to help offset the cost or help increase wages? Um, and then, like I had mentioned earlier, funders really ensuring that they understand that a, a vibrant a nonprofit a workplace really comes from funding it and from providing for staff resources and for providing for multi-year commitments that allow for, for longer um, commitments to staff. All, all of those, uh, I think, could make a big impact. Now, one of the policies that's sort of already underway in some places that I think will have really interesting implications here is salary transparency in job postings. So like, I believe it's like California, New York, Colorado, you're already required to put that salary range on your job posting. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that impacts wages overall, right? Are you going to have 
the organizations that are not competitive with living wages um, really see that hit in their ability to recruit talent because people see that range in the job listing and then just don't apply. Um, you know, and also the impacts that that will hopefully have on, you know, diversity in the workplace, salary equity in the workplace, which is kind of the whole point of it to begin with, right? Um, and so I think seeing how this sort of shakes out in, in the states that have made this law will be really interesting to see over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I wanna pull up one of the questions that was asked. Uh, building movement project data shows that employees of color may see the extent their employers engage in equity and inclusivity differently from their peers. Um, so this implies that when even nonprofit leadership believes they're doing these functions well, some staff may disagree. How do we discuss adopting equitable and inclusive practices, not as a binary activity, but a continuum and help institutions move along that continuum? I think uh, it's vital for nonprofit organizations to adapt DEI or DEIJ, including justice, that into as a pillar of their strategic planning and to leave it there in perpetuity because it's, it is, or to, and another, okay, or to create a board level committee on DEI and justice, just the way you would have a board level committee that looks at finances and looks at the budget and looks at your programs so that every decision that is made by the board by the HR, by every individual, uses a lens of DEI in their decision making. So that it is just in the same way they would have a lens for the budget and a lens for program outcomes and the other lenses these committees represent, this should be the same. No decision should be made without looking at how does this impact our people, our clients, our stakeholders. And also making sure that you are thinking about the disparate impact that some of these DEI initiatives may have, right? Like, are you trying to do these DEI initiatives, but all of the work of thinking about what you need and all the, your staff DEI committee is all your employees of color and like they're being expected to do all of this extra work on top of their other jobs. Um, you know, Lynette just put this in the chat, like fund your DEI work. Um, and I think that that's something that like came across in my survey when folks were talking about DEI and it's everyone who was talking about it across, you know, racial, ethnic, gender lines. Um, it's not enough to just talk about it. You got to actually do it and you got to actually fund it um, and what you're doing. I, th I think um, if I can um, add as well, I think institutionalizing, I think some of the ways you would evaluate how well you're doing in this area would be, you know, great practice as well. And so, you know, if you think about like core competencies, like on your performance um, evaluations, for example, can one of those be, you know, demonstration of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, or other things, you know, um, that the organization would want to uplift around equity and inclusion uh, and belonging. And then um, doing regular organizational culture surveys that go out to all staff, I think is um, another way um, to do that and not just doing that whenever there's like a problem or an issue, right? But um, on an annual, semi-annual basis. It should be part of the assessment of the organization. So a follow-up question that came in um, was, how do we address the fact that there's such a different perception of what enough diversity is, depending on whether you're part of a dominant group as defined by any particular demographic difference, how you grapple with the difference of perception of diversity? It, it's, it's a problem. And, and I will say that there's still many individuals who push back. I gave a keynote a few weeks ago 
and I almost got canceled at the last minute because a very important donor to the organization read my bio and said, I don't want that kind of woke stuff at our meeting. It happens. It's still there. And that's why I like to say when you encounter that in particular, and maybe even more frequently than that, focus instead on performance. Because we know the link between, we know that this brings in higher levels of performance. And go to your stakeholders and argue for performance benefits. Does that answer the question? Was that the question? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'll reiterate it um, in case anyone else wants to jump in, but you know, when you're thinking about diversity as a nonprofit leader, how do you know when you've hit like enough diversity? You know, what what should you be measuring yourself against? I'm I'm not sure if en enough diversity is ever um, attainable. I think that's going to be a constant process and a constant evolution to get better uh, for the organization to measure what they've done in the past and to continue to move forward. Um, for us, we're, we're in the process of implementing a, a diversity scorecard, and that is based on, on participation and questions that grant funders asked us and, and donors ask us. And Really, I think that scorecard is going to be something that we evaluate every year, maybe every six months on what are the things that we should be looking at, um, you know, racial diversity, gender diversity, accessibility, um, what, what are the programs that other people are doing and how we can continue to, to constantly push forward. And also, does our staff know how to elegantly speak to others about the importance of the DEI or a D and I J work that we're doing. Um, it's not just one thing to do it, but also to be able to to explain why it's important, um, why it's important to our donors, and how you can affect change um, by really telling the community about the work that you're doing. Um, so it's measuring, trying to get better, but then also being able to communicate that clearly. Yeah, let me jump in. <laughs> As I said, it's not a journey; it's a process. And I just want to uh, note that Pierre Rogers, who has done a lot of work in this area as well, said again, I'm quoting her from her chat, it's a journey, not an end goal. There's no destination. There's no finish. There's no box to check off. You will never be finished. And that's why we push for things like a standing committee. It will never be finished just the way overseeing your finances is never finished. I'd love to just add a couple of things too. I think, um, you know, having and adopting a learning mindset, I think is just really important in this kind of work too. Um, you know, I'm blessed to have um, a lot of different, you know, staff um, who I work with um, from the younger generations in particular who, you know, educate me daily. Um, around like what other types of diversity, right? That we should be um, uplifting um, and recognizing. I saw earlier in the chat, um, you know, someone talking about um, folks who are neurodivergent and even within that, right? There's just, there's so much in there that we have not really explored um, and talked about. And so I think constantly um, surrounding yourself with people who can educate you and being open to um, that edification, I think is really important. Great. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of agreement in the chat. A lot of, you know, it's a journey. There's no set point. A learning mindset is critical. Um, so that made me think of something that uh, was in Ruth's paper. Um, Ruth, I wanted to ask kind of in initiating these DEIJ efforts, is a lot of this on the like the leadership of an organization? Um, what what roles can be played at different levels? What a great question. Thank you. Again, I have seen this evolve from top down and I've seen it evolve from bottom up. 
I have seen it in middle management where, or, where we did cross, uh, cross specialty groups. An example is a, a scientific research institution who had a, uh, the researchers, the scientific researchers were predominantly white males. The support staff was predominantly people of color and predominantly women. They had a lot of tension between these two groups went to the organization's uh, leadership, pushed it as increasing performance, spent a year in intensive work amongst these two groups, and many years out are still reaping the benefits of this kind of in-depth work between the two groups. This was a middle level in the, in the company. We've seen situations where in for-profit groups, people are wearing their badges and on the back of the badges are their values with listed numbers. So they could call each other out and say, hey, look at uh, number three on your badge. Disrespect to others is not tolerated here. So it comes from all different levels in the organization I'm working with now. It came first at the employee level. It's forcing the board to make the change. So it's very important to understand that any work group, any team, any level of the organization can, can make a difference. And, and to come back, it's about learning from each other. And once we start learning from each other, the performance increases. Yeah, it sounds like um, employees in Gen Z and millennials um, are are in positions where they can um, implement a kind of a bottom up bottom up approach with this. Um, Samantha and Mike, is this something that you're seeing? Um, are there any barriers that you've seen with uh, millennial and Gen Z and trying to advance these efforts? I feel like the barrier, as folks talk about it, is is leadership, right? It's convincing leadership that this is something that, that they need to care about, convincing them that they need to take this learning mindset, right? DEI is not a box you check, right? It's constantly changing, like Linda was talking about, like learning from your younger employees who are having way more advanced conversations about this, right? Um, and they are five steps ahead um, of, of a lot of their leadership in this situation, right? Talking about concepts like privilege and equity and like and that's just much closer to a lot of them right they care they want to talk about it um and they have all of these ideas for how their organizations can do this better leadership just has to listen to them about it and come at it with not this defensive mindset I think sometimes when I've been in conversations about this you can have leadership sort of shut down right and they they don't want to deal with like the accusation of like oh they're not doing enough but like if you come at it with this attitude of, yeah, we're not doing enough, help me think about how we can do this better. That's an attitude that gets you a lot of respect from your employees. And then you back up that like, yes, let's listen with like actually doing something. Um, you know, talking about it is great. Having conversations about it is great. Um, but you will try people's patience if you talk and talk and talk and talk and never actually implement any organizational change. And let me follow on to Sam there. It's not just the talk, I agree. It's about changing people's behaviors. And that comes through challenging their stereotypes. It comes through working against the anti-inclusive practices that inhibit people from en engaging together. So it is behavior. And behavioral change does take time but it takes creating the, putting into place inclusive practices where people can ultimately feel comfortable enough to ask and to learn from each other. And here's just put something in the chat that she's gonna repost so everyone can see it, but about sort of the scarcity mindset um, where like, you know, if you are opening a door for people of color that's closing the door for other people, and something that I saw with some of my respondents that I thought was really interesting was that a lot of them are rejecting that mindset. And you see a lot of folks who are coming from dominant groups saying, I want to see people who don't look like me centered in this work. Like I, 
and like actively saying that like I want to take a step back to center the voices of people who are more impacted by this um and that is a really um compelling shift a really important shift to making organizations more equitable and is another big point of, of disconnect I think between some younger employees they don't have the scarcity mindset in the same way yeah it, I, I love how uh, Ruth's work has, has focused so much on um put, putting together uh a, you know a, a reason for the, the DE and I that um you know that's performance based and, and a model that that helps promote that. I I think um, being able to explain that can can really help maybe talk to some some people who might not think um, in in those terms and help explain why this is important for an organization culture. Leadership um, for organizations is busy. Uh, like I mentioned or, um, earlier, that nonprofit organizations is always a, a lot going on. And talking about stuff just to talk about it isn't the best way maybe to get leadership's attention, but focusing on here are the positive outcomes. If we become more diverse and more equitable and, and more inclusive and, and more just, this is how our organization can benefit. And more importantly, this is how the population that our organization serves um, can, can benefit as well. So being able to explain uh, that benefit is huge with leadership. That's it, emphasizing performance. And, and outcomes. I do want to uh, note that somebody wrote in the chat that they don't want the inclusive practices to lie on the shoulders, I'm paraphrasing, of the most impacted. And, and they absolutely agree 100% and, and uh, putting into place inclusive practices and putting into place accountability and transparency in our HR practices does not rest solely on those from underrepresented groups. It's all of our responsibility and we all benefit. So we have one, uh, we have time for one more question and I'd like to pose this to all of our presenters today. Um, what is one thing that you would like the audience to take away from today? Um, let's start with Ruth. One thing, oh my gosh, there's so much. That this is a process, it involves everyone. And, and it's difficult, but it's vital. Thank you. All right, Samantha. Oh gosh, that's so hard. I think overarching sort of both sessions today, it's that the nature of nonprofit work is fundamentally changing. And if leaders and boards don't get with the program and, fig and figure out how they're gonna change to match that, um, they're not gonna be able to successfully do the really important work that they exist to try to do. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I, I think there's some aspects to which nonprofits are naturally at a disadvantage in the workplace. Um, and competing for high, for high quality talent. And there's at least uh, nonprofit leadership should be very cognizant of some of the things that they can at least do uh, for free or at very low cost to maximize the success of their employees, in particular with their young employees. Great, thank you. Uh, Cheryl, what about you? might be on mute. Sorry oh. about that. I couldn't get my um my mouse to work. Uh, so um I think uh for me that the sort of takeaway is uh I just want to do a sort of shout out to the sort of younger workers that are coming in, the millennials and maybe younger, because I think they're really forcing us to question business as usual. And I think we're seeing that across a lot of the presentations. Thank you. Robbie?
I think you might be on mute. Well, while we're waiting, um, how about we switch and have Carrie go first? Sure. Um, I think that part of what we really need to focus on is the fact that the nonprofit sector is extraordinarily diverse. And so the range of different kinds of work that people are undertaking are extraordinarily diverse. And so we're going to need pretty specialized solutions across different nonprofits based on the tasks that those employees are doing, the motivational profiles of those employees, the skills that are required to do them. But I think one overarching thing that I've heard across all of the presentations today is the necessity for sort of responsive leadership, supportive culture that embraces the idea that if we work outside of a nine to five schedule, it could be considered overwork. It's not quiet quitting, right? And the need really for funders um, to support these, these needs that are being driven by nonprofits and by the people that they, that they serve and work with. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'd also like to ask uh, Linda and Rusty for their takeaways. Um, so Linda, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I think I would just like to emphasize that, uh, you know, it's it really is a shared responsibility um, to improve, um, you know, a lot of the policies and practices to really uplift um, the nonprofit workforce. And, you know, at the micro level and in, inside organizations, it's, you know, all staff, um, leadership, boards of directors, and then, you know, outside um, the funders, um, government, and other, you know, parts of civil society that um, really need to, to dig in. Thanks. Rusty? Well, <clears throat> I think everybody has a role in whatever role we're in, whatever level of positional power or lack thereof we have. Um, organizational culture and sector culture is set by our attitudes and behaviors. So um, we all have a role to play. So thank you. And thank you all very much. I'm going to hand it back over to Lynette. Great. Thank you, Emily and Linda, and again, all of our fantastic presenters. And thank you to the audience. You've stayed engaged with us. Hang in there. We've got about six or seven more minutes, so don't go anywhere just yet. Um, I want to first remind you to take a few minutes to complete the post-event survey, which is going to be linked in the chat. Your feedback is critical to making this symposium better every year and making sure that practitioners and researchers stay in close contact and support each other because we're supporting the nonprofit sector. For a few wrap-up thoughts, I'd like to welcome Cindy Lott, who's an amazing member of our Symposium Planning Committee and an ARNOVA member, and I love her. And um, she's going to share some closing remarks. Cindy? Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynette, and thanks to everybody today. This was, uh, it's been a long time in planning, but I know those of you that were presenting, it's been a long time in your research and thinking through these issues and deciding what to really grapple with. Um, so we are the better for it today. I want to thank everybody for that. I hear so many different issues here, and I want to talk only briefly, substantively, we've covered a lot here, but then talk just a bit about structure and, and I guess um, make a request among everybody that's been able to attend today, but also even for those that may see this later or registered for this event and couldn't join us. I mean, first of all, I think it's so important um, for those of us that are working within the sector to really figure out what our status is. I hear a lot of that. We're struggling here to say, how do we re reflect and represent what we actually do on the ground? It's a translation effort almost to explain to people what it is. And you would think by now we wouldn't have to do this, right? But we do. And it's so important because even as I'm listening and thinking to Carrie's point that there is this huge diversity, even within the sector, it's very hard sometimes to figure out how to group different areas and think about how to translate that in research. We are also up against the fact in a good way um, that so much of our work is also cross-sectoral. We have so many relationships with the for-profit and corporate world and with government. And we have to, you know, our first stage is to know where we are at before we can even advocate properly with these other groups, whether they're funders or they're partners of ours in, uh, or both sometimes simultaneously. 
So I think it's just so imperative, the work that is going on here. And I really urge those of you that are in this particular area to continue, which leads me to my larger point and thank you again um, and request, which is we've now had 11 of these um, different joint sessions, ARNOVA and Independent Sector. We so welcome the nonprofit uh, policy forum as well. Um, we want to continue these. We want your engagement. We hope that you will talk to your colleagues about this, that you will be able to join one or more of these organizations if you're not already in them. Um, I will say having observed all of them over the years and been involved with all three in some form as well, that all of them are now actively engaged in bringing together the practitioner world and also uh, research, whether it's academic or research out in the practice space. And it's really, really imperative that we have that for moving forward and understanding. Um, so for all who have engaged in what can sometimes be, again, a translation process, we thank you for that. And we really hope that you stick with us. We are eager to hear what your ideas will be and those of your colleagues um, about what we can be taking on for next year. So I wanna thank you again, everyone have a great weekend um, and I'm going to turn this back over. All right, thank you, Cindy. We encourage, as Cindy said, we encourage all of you to stay engaged in these conversations with all three of our organizations. Some ways to do that, be on the lookout for a special issue of Nonprofit Policy Forum based on today's event in early 2023. And as a reminder, this journal is open access, so there's no paywall to access content. Everybody has access to this information. Independent Sector will be holding its annual conference, the Upswell Summit, virtually on Tuesday, November 15th. We hope you join and participate in the conversation with sector leaders who are determined to make the changes that we need to improve lives, the natural world, and to strengthen democracy. And just a few days after that summit, ARNOVA will be holding our annual conference November 17th to 19th in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a great opportunity to hear the latest research on nonprofits directly from researchers and academics, those who are both practitioners and researchers. The registration link for that will also be in the chat. That's our program for today. Don't forget to complete that feedback survey. We really need your responses. Thank you for your commitment to the nonprofit sector. We hope you go into the weekend energized and excited by today's conversation. Thank you.